medical doctor by background. Now he's a full professor of uh, in artificial intelligence and digital health in Type A Medical University in Taiwan. His talk is very interesting to me personally. He's going to touch upon a few things. He's going to talk to us about the metaverse, digital twins, and the use of virtual reality. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Professor Shabir to the podium. And please start your talk. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, is it clear, right? Yeah. OK, good. So first of all, I thank organizing committee of this conference and also my friend, Dr. Hamza, for inviting from far away Taiwan to here just to share my experiences. So it doesn't mean I am something big or smart. No, I'm very simple. And just I want to learn. I want to explore what is happening this side of the world. At the same time, I want to express what we are doing uh, in Taiwan. Saying that, as you see, the terms are totally new, like digital twin, virtual reality, metaverse. So always, I insist my students, like, don't go behind technology. Technology is not the key. What is the problem you want to solve? So please focus on the problem. So let me start with that. And as you see, again, I have got inspiration from my friend, Dr. Hamza. Everywhere I put QR code, so you can just click. You can get my website of uh, uh, this thing. So as you see, I am a citizen of India, but I did my medical education from St. Petersburg, Russia, and then my master's in telemedicine and e-health from Norway, Tromso, and PhD from Taiwan. So if you see, like, I have quite traveled, so I know healthcare systems of different parts of the world. So that's also a good experience for me uh, to share what I have learning. So as I told, my importance will be on the needs on the problem, not on the technology. Technology is like technology, science, it keeps on changing from time to time. If you call me next, after three months, I will be talking some about new technology, but problems are the same. So unless we solve the problem, technology will not help. So as you know, our lives have changed to before COVID and after COVID. And our healthcare system got like totally crashed when there was a COVID, just because we were only focusing on COVID and underestimating or neglecting other serious diseases. And trust me, more people died because of other chronic condition than COVID, but we were only focusing still on COVID. So here are some problems. We want to reduce unnecessary visits now, because it is not like before, whenever you want, you go to the hospital and get uh, see your doctor. No. Now you should go very carefully, only and only if needed. Second, obviously, if we are not asking them to visit hospital, then how we are doing? We need to remotely monitor and interpret the data which we collect from the patient. Right? Unless even they come to hospital or not, we are getting into their homes. We are providing some devices, like variable devices, and we get their data, and still we are monitoring them. The fourth thing is like long-term care for chronic disease management. Yes. These infectious diseases are like very short period of time. That is why we call them as like acute conditions. But chronic conditions, they are some diseases are like lifelong time, like cancer, like diabetes, hypertension, a chronic kidney disease. So how we are going to deal with them, right? Then we need to also have teleconsultations for patients at their home. So same thing reflects my second point, like we don't want to visit, uh, we don't want them to unnecessarily visit hospital. Then we need to provide teleconsultations for the patients at home. And at the same time, we should ensure continuity of the care. So once you have all this list of problems, then we will see how the technologies which I am going to uh, uh, describe are, are going to answer this of, uh, some of these or uh, this uh, question. And these are the problems. 
and these are the solutions sort of things like advancing technologies in healthcare like wearable device now we have heterogeneity of data we have on demand health uh, care and also ai screening like prediction prevention and also we have patient portals we have telehealth and virtual doctors so all these things are emerging and especially after covid then let us start with the definitions what is digital twin because first i want to go with bit complex thing then i will go back to the virtual reality and metaphase and the next speaker is also more emphasizing on how metaphase can be used on rehabilitation but in my case i will be focusing on how we can do a holistic approach and how we can use this digital twin digital twin is nothing but a digital representation of an intended or actual real world physical product system or process and to update in real time and use simulations machine learning reasoning to help decision making what is going to happen in future basically digital twin is not a new concept in next few slides you will see it has started by nasa in 1970s usually what happens is when we want to send some satellites we cannot send a mechanic or engineer to go there and repair it therefore we need to replicate what's happening there back in our computers simulate and see what's wrong most of the time you will be uh, knowing like okay there was a launch of a rocket but it was cancelled at the last minute how is that it's all because of digital twin it's all about simulation the simulation will say something is going wrong then they stop the mission then they rectify it and then they will send so these are like simple examples and then comes virtual reality i think most of you are aware what is virtual reality it's nothing but use of computer technology to create simulated environment that can be explored in 360 degrees unlike traditional interface uh, of uh, this thing we are uh, where we can see like 180 degree sort of thing and this is gives an immersive experience immersive means you are inside now i can take medical students inside heart and show them see this is your tricuspid wall this is bicuspid wall this is ventricles this is auricles so everything we go inside and see it's not like seeing a book and reading about the arteries or veins or heart then i go back again to uh, digital twin concept of digital twin as i told it is from 1970s to monitor nasa satellites and maintenance a virtual replication of physical asset that reflect the current status through real time transformed data digital twin to transform healthcare now comes why i am talking about digital twins in healthcare as we are doing for satellites we want to do for human body and why i will explain once you convert your body into digital twin it is in computer in the hospital and whenever you want you can send to any doctor for second opinion you don't need to go and visit so there are various advantages i will talk about that and this is the history of the thing so it started in 70s then the concept and theorizing become in 2003 only in 2010 the first definition came from the nasa and in 16 the concept consolidated new definitions and recognized again with the advancement of devices technologies we are managing to get more mature uh, devices to collect data from body that is what i will be talking this this is very important <coughs> to understand there are three basic things which make you a disease person number one genetic data that means which we got inherent from our parents that we cannot change because what we got we got if i am prone to get diabetes i will get it right then comes 
clinical data which we go to the hospitals from time to time, the doctor will treat us, then we get all clinical data there. There is an, there is third thing which is called behavioral data. That means how you behave. So I want to go back again. There are three things which make you diseased. One is your genetics. Second thing is your environment where you are living. Again, you cannot do much with your environment because if I ask you to change the place, it's not so easy for you to go to some other place. But the third thing is your behavior. Yes, that is in our hands and that is exactly what we want to do, how I can motivate you to have proper health, uh, what to say, a lifestyle, behavior. Because what you eat is on you, what you can drink is on you, when you can sleep is on you, how much physical exercise you can do is on you. All these things are behavior, lifestyle, which we can modify. And by doing this, we can do three things. Number one, we can prolong the onset of any disease. For example, if I am prone to get diabetes, but if I do regular exercise, if I stop eating uh, sweet, uh, sweets or sugar and um, uh, less carbohydrate, so instead of getting now, I may get my di uh, diabetes after four or five years. You see, that itself is big advantage for us. Like we are having five years of normal life. Second thing is, Okay, you cannot prevent every time, but at least you can early detect. Because now I already know I am prone to get a disease, but then I start monitoring myself carefully so that I early detect. Any disease can be detected, uh, if detected early, it can be cured with less medicine, less time, less pain, and less money. So it's like advantage for both patients and care providers. So digital twins consist of all these three important things and real-time acquisition of data is the key. Because genetic data is one time. Once you do sequencing of your blood, it is there. You don't need to go do every often your uh, these things. And uh, clinical data keep on adding when you go to the hospital, when the doctor prescribes you some medications. But the uh, behavior or lifestyle data is something real time. This real time comes from our wearable watches or any wearable device which can collect your body movement and your heart rate. For now, these two are very important indicators because from heart rate, we can get heart rate variability which reflects our autonomous nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. So whatever happens in your body, the first thing get reflected is our autonomous nervous system. By seeing this, we can predict what is going to happen with a person who is uh, yeah, having a, a, a digital twin. So this is the concept of uh, digital twin, like physical environment, monitoring, testing, procedures, everything we can simulate. Because now we know all about the body. Even we can put, okay, if I put penicillin, whether there will be allergy or not. Because now, I don't know whether we are, they are practicing here in Kuwait or not, but in uh, our side, if you want to give penicillin, they give a small dose here. They put one pencil like round and they wait for 10 minutes. Then they give the real penicillin because so many people have reaction to the penicillin. But in this case, you don't need to wait. You just key in, okay, if I give penicillin, what is going to happen? By reflecting to the genetic information, the computer will say, no, don't give, he has like reaction to the penicillin. So this is like one of the example. <coughs> Other thing is, as, you, as I said, we can do tele-monitoring of the patient personalized healthcare because right now we are doing one size fit uh, care. That means if like 10 people are having one problem, like one disease, we are giving same drug to 10 people. But this is not correct because some may have allergy, some may not uh, react to the drug, some may even have very serious complications. But if you have all this information, then we can personalize healthcare or treatment procedure and development of personalized treatment options. And the other thing is this very important, providing clinical decision support and prognosis, and we can take multiple opinions. Now, maximum, we can go to the other doctor and 
tell all our history and then he see and then he give opinion. But what happens, this is happening in Taiwan, like all rich people, they want to make their digital twins and keep it in hospital, let the doctor take care of their body and their uh, what is happening. And whenever they need opinion, they don't need to only limit it to the same, uh, uh, what to say, hospital. They can send to any expert in the world because it's digital. Just by clicking one button, uh, uh, the all information goes to the doctors or consultant where they need to take second opinion. And this will be definitely helpful in preventive measures for patients because we already believe in 4P medicines, that is prediction, prevention, personalization, and participation. This is very important. So uh, once we do preventive, uh, predictive, then we can prevent. Then we early detect. Then we stop uh, getting into complications. This is how we need to manage healthcare. So now I will jump a little bit from, OK, digital twin is there, concept is there. Then we will talk about how we are uh, supplementing with metaverse. Metaverse is totally different issue, where we take patients to a new platform, which is virtual, but there are some things which we can make use, like teleconsultations, for example. How about doctor and patient going into metaverse and having their treatment? At the same time, doctor is seeing all the information of the patient uh, using uh, VR and uh, digital twin, uh, what's happening with the patient. So again, this is R&D concept. It's not established, but as I told, science is nothing but progression and progression. There is no full stop in success. There is no full stop in science. Only we have commas, one after other coming. If you call me after three months, six months, I will talk about something new. Like for example, autonomous digital twins. What is autonomous digital twins? Now we have all information. Now we add AI to that and predict what is going to happen. And we can even control the, what you say, uh, manage to prevent some disease or some events which would happen if we were not monitoring. OK. Here is like digital twins, and other one is immersive environment, assistive and therapeutic support. All this comes to the metaverse. And this is very important to understand. That this is 3i concept, immersion, interaction, imagination. This is nothing but gives you metaverse. And uh, now I take you some examples where we have done virtual reality examples, or what you say, virtual reality uh, among elderly, usefulness and acceptance from Taiwan. This is now, from here after, I will be giving some examples of the studies which we have done using VR. For me, acceptance is the step one. It doesn't matter how good treatment I am providing you. If you are not taking the medicine, then finish. Uh, nothing can be done about it. You cannot improve the quality. Therefore, acceptance was uh, very important for uh, our for us. So again, I uh, have put QR code. Just uh, put it, uh, click the picture. You take you to the paper, full paper of that, so that you can read about it. So here, what we did, we selected 30 elderly participants, and we twice a week, 15 minutes at each visit for six weeks duration. We gave this session to them, and then we are games to promote activity, promote users, provide entertainment, so that make them feel happy, at the same time, motivate them to do some physical exercise, because these were elderly people, about 65 years, so what we used to do is that, okay, for some times we used to give them games of upper arms, so they need to, balls will be coming, they need to do like this, like this. In that way, they are motivated to uh, move their upper limbs. And uh, after some times, we give exercise for lower limbs. Again, there will be football, they need to kick, all those uh, activity, all there is archery for the hand, all those things. So at the end, we took a questionnaire based on TAM model, technology acceptance model, where we have easy to use, user perceptions, 
social norms, all those things. I will show you those things, see? Pursued usefulness, easy of use, how much they enjoyed, social norm, experience, and intention to use. If you see, most of them, like seven, more than 70 is like, they want to use, they are happy, they are feeling usefulness, all those things. And the conclusion was, VR was useful in 77 responses, easy to use in 64, and provides enjoyable experience for 80%. And positive attitude of old uh, towards intention of use is 71%. Because usually we think elderly people don't like technology, but it is not. If we give appropriate technology to the people at the right time, definitely they will like it. Other study was randomized control trial. So first we went with a survey, then we did randomized control trial, effect of VR sessions on quality of life, because that is the key for me. I am, although I am a medical doctor, right now I am focusing on the patient's life after hospital treatment. So usually the clinicians end their job within the premises of the hospital. They, they don't care much what is happening with the patients at their home, but now I want to bring the technologies into the homes of the patients and see how we can improve the quality of life, especially when there is chronic diseases like cancers and uh, chronic kidney disease. So happiness, functional fitness among older population because again, uh, Taiwan, Japan, uh, and those Far East countries are more uh, experiencing rapid aging population. It's very serious problem. The birth rate is low and the aging population is uh, increasing and there is nobody to take care because once the people get older, we need some people to take care of them. We don't even have people. So this is very serious problem in Taiwan. Therefore, we are focusing how we can manage uh, aging by using technology. That is, the, we call it as active aging, healthy aging, all those stuff. Again, uh, to determine the effect of VR session on quality of life, happiness, functional fitness of older population, uh, we took them, uh, first we had baseline uh, information about them at the end, then we did, uh, after giving this type of sessions, we calculated their happiness and all those things. So obviously the results shows uh, positive results. They were happy, they were more active but when they use these things. Then the conclusion was quality of life improved significantly after VR sessions. Improvements in pain, anxiety, and depression uh, dimensions in post VR sessions. Happiness was there and functional fitness was also positive. And then I want to finish this last example, the effect of virtual reality <coughs> in medical education and clinical uh, care. This is literature review paper, which is accepted in digital health, but uh, it's in press, therefore I cannot give you the QR code, but very soon it will be there online. So here what we did is how VR is used both for medical education and for clinical practice. So overcome obstacles like lack of cadavers, concern for patient safety, resource and budget, budget constraints. Because VR is really a good tool for medical education because now you don't need to go to, again, post-COVID era, we don't want accumulation, and uh, also we were uh, lacking uh, cadavers because one body, like 10 students behind it. Uh, therefore, how about just using VR and doing your own experiment with the cadaver or uh, body? You can even operate, you can see whatever you want. Then, build technical and non-technical competencies enable unbiased and documented evaluation of user experience. Because again, VR play a very important role in education, not only in training, but also in testing, evaluating how much skills you have learned. And at the same time, VR for therapeutic treatment. Again, because of this uh, COVID, there was a lot of change in regulations, because now, 
they are people are allowing to reimburse the televisits and teleconsultation and also now we are also uh, what you say fda is approving samd software as medical device solutions so improve mental health <coughs> aids in motor performance and cognitive functions rehabilitations so our uh, my friend in next talk will be talking exactly on rehabilitation using virtual reality and metaphors and offer therapeutic experience in a safe and engaging environment and effectiveness of vr system in terms of medical education training that is knowledge skill attitude confidence everything can be uh, improved and secondary uh, usefulness will be feasibility and acceptability of vr systems in medical education and clinical care so this is the model uh, research review which we done we started with 3700 and end up only in 28 because we had so much inclusion and exclusion criteria and then out of this 28 medical education and medical training were like 11 and therapeutic treatment and long term care uh, use of uh, vr was in 17 studies which were analyzed and then 9 out of 11 showed improvement see not all but again this is what we found in literature so this is not our data it's what we found from literature and 14 out of 17 trials showed improvement again knowledge skills confidence attitude everything was improved uh, in this medical education uh, cognitive and motor performance were improved stress anxiety depression pain uh, mentalization and mood was improved uh, people who were having uh, therapeutic treatment with vr these are the result like 13 studies assess the feasibility and user experience in addition to clinical outcome all the studies showed positive response to vr intervention or training with high acceptability and feasibility and effect of vr treatment sessions vr durations had no effect on effect of majority of outcome measures studies for medical education were scheduled within a single session and lasted 15 minutes to maximum 2.5 hours only a single study carried out six therapeutic sessions because i don't know how many people have experience of uh, vr because long term use of vr is not advisable because it has little bit stains on our eyes so it's always good to have a short but three to four sessions if you prefer instead of having one hour two hours of sessions with the vr and majority of studies showed improvement in outcome measures in both patient care the finding implied that vr system was safe entertaining and effective for the participants there are huge variations in study with respect to study design vr contents device evaluation methods and treatment period this is another big problem with this type of studies because it is still emerging there is no standard of having any evaluation or training things so everyone do according to their uh, feasibility according to their plans so it's very hard to generalize everything in uh, with in one platform and future implication establishing standard that explicitly describe vr procedure and urgent need for collaboration between vr simulation industries and physicians this is very important because for anything you want to do vr you need to have vr content and vr content is developed by industries or software engineers not by a doctors or physicians so we physicians can only teach okay if i want to talk about chronic kidney disease i know okay start with the kidney then show how it functions all these things has to be transformed into a content we are content by the industry so we need to work closely with that and another example we are we need is we need to make open source of this we are content so now you go to youtube and watch whatever you want that is should be exactly in we are content you go to youtube or you go to any platform and should be able to see whatever you want now everything is purchased you need to 
pay a lot of money to see any content or to develop a content. So these are like policy issues which the government at the high level should take care and provide opportunities for the young uh, students and uh, physicians to make them use in both medical education and clinical practice. So these are my take home message, focus on needs, problems, not on technology because technology will be keep moving, keep changing. So don't need to stuck with the technology, consider technology as a tool, not as a solution. Focus on preventive and early detection. Don't sit in hospital till the patient come with a problem. It's too late already. So therefore we need to be proactive. Technology should be used to empower and engage patients. That's very important. And other than that, I think this is very important for most of people, the market size, how much money we are going to make by digital twins, it's like estimated 184 billion by 2030. So it's huge market. It's worth investing some time, efforts to learn, to know what is happening with that. At the same time, the global VR market project to increase from less than 12 million this year to 22 billion by 2025. So these both are huge markets. It's worth investing. It's worth, uh, what you say, focusing on them. Uh, hopefully, you will be success to uh, get uh, at least part of that. So at the end, I am a guest editor for this journal called Cancers from MDPI, which has impact of 6.5, I suppose, yeah. Uh, and uh, anything uh, using wearable device for home care for patients with cancer is accepted in the uh, journal. And I will be happy to expedite that and let me know that you are submitting. I will expedite and see you get like soon uh, review from the reviewers. I think these are the few things which I wanted to share. Now I will be happy to take some questions from you guys. Thank you. Uh, the, uh, the feasibility was assessed by using TAM model, technology acceptance model. That is, we have questionnaire. After experiencing these six weeks, two, day, two sessions every week, how do you like it? Number one. Are you happy with it? Two. Okay, uh, is, do you feel easy to use it? Three. Uh, do you have intention to use this technology? Like in that way we had like questionnaire and then we make analysis of that questionnaire and in that way we have uh, this thing. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. So again, uh, this is like more personalized stuff for given patients. So I am not saying this is like blanket therapy or blanket approach. So we should be selecting the patient according to their need, according to their ability, their feasibility. So uh, depending on the need and the disease of the patient, we need to uh, go with the, these things. Because I want to use VR mostly for the patients which, la, which are depressed, which are lonely, and stuff like that, and they are not motivated to do some physical exercise. In that way, it will be much easier for them to do. It's like very simple, uh, for example, if a classroom, for example, a professor or a teacher and students, if they want to start with this, first they need to get enrolled. There are like a uh, sandbox, there is a platform of metaverse. They need to, for example, simple example I will give. How we use line, we in uh, Taiwan, we use lot of line or WhatsApp here, if you say, we make a group. Professor will be there and students will be there and whatever we want to communicate, we use that channel. Simple. Same thing we can do with the metaverse. Instead of writing on phone, you use the glass and you go to virtual classroom and you meet your students. And then you start interacting, talking. So here you don't need to just go in physical to one college, in one room, all those things. So that's how it starts. So if you want, just make a, your group in the virtual world and go there and start uh, talking, discussing, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Okay, before we go to our second keynote presentation, we have the QR codes for you for today.
for so if you'd like to get the uh, CPD credits, please uh, scan the QR code. Okay, our, our second keynote presentation will be delivered by Professor Amin Choko. Professor Amin is joining us all the way from Canada. He is um, an associate professor in the College of Rehabilitation Sciences in the University of Manitoba. He is the Jerry McDowell Research Chair. He is also an adjunct professor in the Biomedical Engineering, also at the University of Manitoba. He's going to also present to us concepts in the metaverse. He's going to present the potential of rehabilitation in the metaverse. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Shukran jazeera on hadi al-istidaf al-tayba. Uh, I would like to thank all the, uh, the organization for this international class conference. I'm really surprised by the quality of the speakers, the presenters, the questions, and all the uh, environments. This is my first conference in the Arab world. I have back, uh, Arab background. I'm from Tunisia, but I live 20 years abroad in Europe and Canada. So I'm so excited to be here to present for the first time. I'm doing that with my heart uh, and my brain, obviously. My brain is not functioning 100%. I feel like it's 2 a.m., but I will do my best. My apologies for that. If I am people who deal with uh, cognitive things, they will understand that I am having kind of uh, issues with uh, planning, sequences planning, and things like that. You'll understand. So my talk is about the potential of rehabilitations in the metaverse. Before getting into the metaverse, uh, I'm going to uh, drive you through present my lab. Are you hearing me OK? Yes, OK. Loud, very loud? OK. So I'm going to show my lab so that because you, you, we don't need to sh uh, each other, present some, de some of the developments, current developments, a uh, little bit of my future plan, how I'm envisioning the future, um, uh, present my visions for potential rehabil and, and of rehabilitation in the metaverse, and kind of futuristic approach to open the discussion for later for a sequence of questions. So I could present this talk virtually from Canada, but to be honest, something will be lacking. So I started my presentation. <laughs> Something will be lacking, and that's the feeling of presence. That's the most important thing. As human beings, we, over the last century, we live with three revolutions, actually. The first one is the industrial one, then the information one that brought us into all those technologies and buildings and stuff. Now, my belief is that we are in the middle of a social revolutions, and what we are doing is we want to be connected. We want technology, we, don't, we want everything to be smart, but we want things to be connected. We want to connect with each other, with therapists, with families, with everything, in education, healthcare, and in all the spheres of life. So technology is best when it brings people uh, together. The main vision of my, of my work, the main philosophy of my work, is to meet people where they are. And here I join Dr. Shabir in believing that some of the healthcare services should be provided at home. We should, whether they are preventative or interventions, we should send people home. We should unclog the healthcare system and the hospital and send people home. And technology can help in that. The other aspects, we should care for people who are uh, taking care of others. Usually in the literature and scientists, we think about the patients, we think about the uh, care provider, but caregiver family members is very important regardless of the culture. In this region of the world, we have a nice culture and family is taking care of people, but this area is not covered at all, is not explore, explored at all. Family are covering for the healthcare system, actually, in, in, in this culture, uh, but technology is, is not helping and no one is doing science in that area. In Western culture, no one is taking care for the elderly, for example. So the healthcare system is helping them, but healthcare system you know it probably better than me. We cannot, we have answers for everything. We only treat people like an emergency room, like firefighter, but when it comes to quality of life, we are not covering, uh, 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 we are not taking care of people beyond that one-to-one -one service between a healthcare provider and a patient. So those are the major philosophies that drive my, my work. So coming from Canada, I was, and I know your great hospitality, and thanks again, I was thinking of bringing uh, six envelopes that I'm, I will be trying to open with you. So before drawing you into the uh, rehab and the metaverse and the potential and future, I will be starting by presenting my lab, then the smart suite that I have developed, present my research program, outline my research program, sorry. If not, I will uh, be uh, out of time, <laughs> I'll be running out of time. Uh, I'll be talking about rehabilitation post-pandemic uh, post and how I am thinking about the metaverse uh, later on. 
So let's dive into my lab. The first vision of this lab that started in 2018 is to increase quality of life and social particip participations of people with physical or cognitive impairments through using and developing and deploying uh, technology enabled interventions. So I'll be talking about technology all the time, but I am not an engineer. I am developing interventions that are based on technology. And here I joined Dr. Shabir and thinking about contents. I never buy technology to use it, just some basic technology. I develop my own technologies. So here, he, uh, uh, I, I want to give a heads up about my presentations. You will uh, see some photos, some videos. Uh, please, I'm not doing any commercial. I'm not a salesperson. Those, those are done for communication purposes, media relationship, or when we are asking for grants in Canada or the world. So I am not a salesperson. <laughs> this is just for a conflict of interest. <clears throat> so when we think about my field in rehabilitation, we have a plethora of technology. It's about preventing sometimes, if you have health promotion people in the room. Uh, it's about interventions. We have less technology when it comes to monitoring patient at home or uh, uh, in the hospital. And recently, during COVID-19, uh, uh, a boom in, the, uh, in, in, in deploying uh, technologies for communication purposes, whether between family members or with the, um, the healthcare system. So this brings me to philosophy a little bit. I'm not going to philosophy a lot today, just a little bit here, about who we are as human in terms of our relationship with technology. So humans started by, you know, wood and fire, and we, you know, uh, thousands of years ago, trying to cook and eat and survive. Today, we have a lot of technologies. In rehabilitation, we have what we call assistive devices. So we started doing those phys physical technologies that are assistive devices. And in the literature, we call that humanism. So we are using physical objects to deal with the environment. This is how we think in occupational therapy and rehabilitation. Uh, sciences, so that phase is reality and it starts to be really outdated. The next phase is transhumanism, and I believe you are in that uh, period of our evolution of human being in terms of our relationship with technology, and is we are, so we are transhuman using physical objects, digital, digital objects, and we are already in virtual reality. When you are using your iPhone, you are already doing some virtual reality, actually. So we are in that transhumanism, and we are moving, I don't know, uh, hopefully or unhopefully, for a post-humanism section. I believe that we are being manipulated by technology a little bit. If you have iPhone, you are already manipulated. If you have this and this, you are already using technology. This is you. Who can leave house this morning here in the room without taking your smartphone and uh, an iPhone? Who has iPhone here in the room? Who has not iPhone in the room? To dinosaurs, hello. <laughs> so, sorry, just a joke. So th that is reality. So what, when we think as scientists, it's a reality. We have technology. We cannot live without technology. That is reality, and technologists in the room here can probably confirm that. So that post humanity uh, will not will probably be a threat. I have no idea, but that's what we are. I believe we are in the transhumanism phase. We will be having VR for education. Healthcare, general life. Uh, I have two boys, two kids. They are already in VR. They are already buying things online. They deal with cryptocurrency. They, bar, they, they are buying non fungible token to play, which is digital objects. We can buy digital art. A month ago, a big conference happened in the world about the metaverse in the metaverse. So we don't know the organization for this conference. It's a metaverse conference in the metaverse. So that's that's something new I have never he heard about. So this is about our relationship, and philosophy will stop here. So what drives my lab is that the philosophy, I'm looking at a proactive healthcare system that provides continuous personalized care and present care as a continuum, and I, I'll be adding participatory uh, things. Uh, Canada is le leading the world in terms of something called in medicine for physicians, shared decision-making processes. So there is a Canada research chair, Dr. France, France Ligaret, who is doing that, and that's sharing decision-making between physician and patients. In rehab, we don't have that yet. Probably we will head toward that, and that's the participatory piece. We need to educate patients so that they get involved in the therapy to uh, 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 optimize the outcomes, actually. So this is what, what drive my... My work, I situate my research in the middle between the advocacy and the policy and the high-level policies till the community, how we connect 
So my, my dream, I'm striving for an ultra-connected living model. This is what, what drives my, my research. I wanna be, uh, I'm seeing people ultra-connected with themselves, their family, the governments, the system, but also with healthcare provider. I know healthcare provider will come last, health will come last, but we are taking that train uh, for sure. It's obvious to me. We are heading toward that direction. So research will bring evidence. Uh, evidence will uh, improve practice, hopefully. Practice will provide feedback, and this is how we, we will continue that loop. Uh, when we look uh, deeper into, in, into the science, uh, in 2020, in Canada, we surveyed 2,000 people asking about if they use telehealth or not by the beginning of COVID-19. And one of two people is using telehealth. Uh, most of them are happy, uh, 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 feel confident using technology in teleconferencing uh, 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 therapy. Uh, and, uh, well, the health, uh, healthcare system in Canada is fragmented, it's so different from here. So we cannot cover those systems, but people are willing to pay. This is so surprising for researchers. Imagine the population is willing to pay for healthcare service uh, based on technology. So, so that's very encouraging. Uh, and in fact, we are seeing some like uh, preliminary results that technology will help maintain relationship, reduce social isolation, and improve both physical and cognitive health. Now when we look at clinicians, we have data from the USA. So uh, they surveyed over 500 people specifically in rehabilitation, so there is no physician involved here and no nursing I, from what I remember. And uh, basically it's also, uh, well, it's encouraging, partially encouraging because uh, therapy professional, you know, uh, uh, rehabilitation professional feels comfortable. One over two people feel comfortable using technologies, but unfortunately, only one quarter feel knowledgeable about rehabilitation. So there is a need of education, and for existing providers, there is a need for continuing education. We have to reconsider that, and uh, I don't know of any country in the world who is ready for that. This is a global issue that is currently happening, just because of the growing. Uh, existing of technologies. Now what, what I think about my own contribution, that was just data, this is my own contribution, I'm part of international work. Uh, so we are trying to, uh, with 15 uh, countries, led by Leiden University in, 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 in Holland and the Netherlands, and uh, what we are trying to see, this, those are primary data, and what we, uh, so we try to talk to uh, professionals. We, understand, we see that, we ask it, who is using technology? So PT are people who are very, uh, PT uh, physicians and geriatricians are people who uh, use a lot of technology. OT comes late, sorry for the OTs, and nurses and SLPs and psychiatrists. So we can think of that. Those are not strong data. Those are primary data from our analyses. analyses. So when we looked at what they use, what they have already used with their patients, actually they use mobile apps, video consultations, and health sensors. Those are the top three. After that came the Exor Games, Robotics, and VR. Probably, uh, just probably, you are not analyzing data yet. Probably because uh, Exor Games or Robotics and VR are less easy to use. So that's the usability aspect of things that we are trying to explore. When we look at the effectiveness, we have exactly the same profile meaning that people now, therapists, are going for the easy to go. Why mobile apps are the first? Because any therapist, as a human being, have that technology, not as therapists. They don't need training for that. So there is no uh, need for continuing education to embark on the technology and adopt technology in their practice. They are using their mobile phone. Again, it's like you all, you take, you put your pocket and your hand in your pocket and you take that iPhone and you work. So it's kind of uh, 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 something they do as a human, not as, uh, as professionals. So now, uh, again, we are still in my lab. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to draw this as what is the top three of profiles uh, when it comes to current professionals. Uh, okay for current, I have six boxes. So, uh, 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 so we are thinking about who, you, who is using technology and for what profile. So geriatrics are the number one, followed by stroke. So most of work is, ra is based on uh, uh, geriatric uh, populations, uh, uh, um, in particular, work on, on, for, for aging in place, and then stroke and neuro, uh, neuro uh, cognitive uh, rehab. Sorry, I have the system here. We asked providers to tell us a little bit about their experience. So, how what would be the determinant for them being successful working with patients? How how they would success? 
So they ask it. Uh, and, and actually, determinants of using technology with the patients was their, their cognitive functioning. So we need, for example, working with someone with dementia would be uh, challenging. Their digital literacy, this is a whole area of research that I'm also doing. And then their motivation. Some people just don't want to have technology as part of a therapeutic pro process. Uh, well, when we ask them about the system itself, uh, we are surprised because cost is not a problem. The problem is how organizations, hospital or ministries of thing, or thing, are uh, considering um, uh, allocating resources for digital technology-based uh, interventions and, in, and implementations policy toward using technology in practice. So that was my lab, rtlab.ca, uh, rtlab.ca. Now I will dive you into the smart suite. So again, under the ultra-connected model of care, I was th I'm thinking about sending people home as much as possible, as fast as possible, so they need to have an environment that is adequate for their treatment and technology that will support them, which we, which we call as a technology for assisted living. So, we have, re we have re 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 repurposed two rooms as, a, as, a, as an apartment. It looks like a hotel suite or something like that. It's a, a one bedroom apartment that is obviously fully furnished, fully functional, uh, a lot of smart technologies, and we developed probably 70% of it. So it's not just about uh, uh, purchasing. So we have here a normal bathroom, the Canadian or American standards, just to allow therapists to go and assess patients as they are doing now. Here we have a smart bathroom with some developments going on now, like smart, uh, smart mirror, things like that. This is a bed, a normal bed for now, but we are doing the next version, which would be the smart bed. And that's an idea that is under ideations. Uh, nothing uh, fancy here. And a whole smart uh, kitchen. And this is probably 40% of the developments that I will show uh, later on. And we have published about it if you want to read about the literature. So to your left here, you can see the real space as it looks uh, last week, actually. Uh, so that's the real kitchen, and that's the virtual reality. The real kitchen, I have two ideas here. The real kitchen is only an example for therapists, companies, patients to understand how they could evolve in a futuristic environment in a combination of reality and futuristic environments. To the left is the virtual reality of the same environments to enable neurocognitive training. So the idea when you think as a researcher, you have someone training in a virtual reality environment, but reality, virtual, VR is VR. So you want to observe the transfer of training from VR environments to real environments. So I am training people outside the city in VR, and I'm trying to see when I'm bringing back here how they would behave how they will respect time, how they respect their con the, the tasks that we are asking them to do in, in terms of quality and time and all the uh, cognitive processes. So all that idea started by one invention that I thought of it here, because as a person, I am the shortest in my family, but all discussion in family, how we do with things. Everything is small when you are tall, right? So I'm talking about ergonomics things. If you have ergonomics experts in the room, uh, you can think of that. So we started about this small idea which is having a height adjustable cabinetry that can solve a lot of problems in the workplace, if you think ergonomics, but also in the houses. So that cabinetry, for example, this one, everything can move up, down, or in separate way. So imagine all those applications that you can have in your house, at your work, in your garage, in any workstation, in any uh, uh, occupation you, you want to be uh, involved in. So uh, I cannot go through all the details just because I'm running out of time. But that's the uh, major idea. So that's the normal bathroom. This is just a, a telepresence robot that you have seen. We have a smart blind. So it's voice activated. You just say light on, and you have blinds. You say blind off, and you see the street. So that's the idea about the voice activation. But we applied in all the spheres of life when you are in the kitchen and in the house, as much as, much as possible, actually. I believe I have another video. And that's the smart bathroom.
So yeah, okay, so uh, just the problem of synchronization. This is a, the, uh, the smart blind. You can see the blinds turn on and off. So just voice activation. I've just got the voice just to respect you here. So yeah, so that's the view of, of what, what, what we see when they are on the other one. So and, and again, we loop in here, the strategy is we are doing research, but it's also we are starting to train people in the smart suite, occupational therapists in particular, to see what is doable in terms of home adaptation and, and patient assessment in a new environment as compared to conventional environments. Uh, and also uh, providing service, a company can come and test their technologies and things like that. So this is a framework, and I am so proud of this uh, new paper published just last week with colleagues from Saudi Arabia, actually, and one colleague from, um, from the UK. Uh, and actually, we are when we look at the literature now for people who are a fan of frameworking, in this area, which is the ambient assisted living technologies, all the frameworks are limited, or as Dr. Shabir said, uh, they are about, uh, they are limited and focused on technology, just technology. So we looked at the holistic model where we combine, you know, organization, business, human, and technology. I can develop later if you have questions about that. So now, who is the user of Smart Suite? When you look at the literature, again, the issue is technology is initiated by computer science, not by people like myself and Dr. Shabir and, and you guys here. So we look at that, who is doing that? And again, I don't want to bother you with statistics. I'm just bringing the champions. So the champion is the asymptomatic people, simply because people in computer science don't understand anything about healthcare, which is natural, which is normal. So they are doing with their students, with, uh, you know, with uh, 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 non-sick patients. So we have just asymptomatic. We don't know much about people with dementia and things like that. So this is a way of pushing research toward the you know, uh, cognition and dementia. So I started thinking of AI. This is how I started five years ago. I said, oh, the, the uh, something to go should be AI. But at that time, doing AI in human, even in Canada, is a lot. Uh, it's a bit tricky. So I started with animals, just being as a consultant with the company, thought of animal. And here I'm going to show cage view that they have here in the room right there I will show, which is just thinking, oh, sorry. That's why I wanted to use my laptop, sorry about that. So I'm gonna show cave, cave view and probably just to save time you will see what it is. Again, it's not a commercial, please. Introducing cage view, a smarter way to monitor and control animal behavior and diet. CageView allows researchers to control and connect to their lab remotely through the use of our state-of-the-art device. CageView is designed to provide tightly controlled conditions where an animal's food intake, behavior, and exercise intensity can be monitored. Researchers using CageView no longer need to manually control the feeding and fasting process by using our robotized smart feeder mechanism where they can schedule feeding and fasting scenarios via our CageView app. Researchers will also have access to 24-7 real-time monitoring through the use of our smart vision device. CageView's trained AI algorithm can identify and track the caged animal and record its motion. The statistical data will then be stored and reported using graphical tools and metrics on our CageView app. The CageView app also provides an Access Anywhere log of the animal's feeding and fasting history, food schedule, and movement, along with a histogram of travel distance over a certain period of time. Those are just some of the features and benefits researchers will notice when they use CageView. Okay, so if you want to test it or see it, I have it in with my laptop and devices there. I will show it in this room. Probably organization can help you more. Thanks so much, thanks so much. I would like to publicly thank the organization for giving me an extension. <laughs> thank you, sorry again, my, my, my cognition is kind of. So that was my first experience like about four years ago about uh, artificial intelligence. Now I'm trying to think about applying what, what they call computer vision actually in monitoring people in a home environment that can be smart suite or just minor application that we can embed like now in uh, standard houses actually because it's just about a couple of sensors as you can see here is a couple of sensors that we can in place in the house and it's called what we call media server we have experts here that can explain more and then we send it to a machine learning cloud 
And here, ethically, we will remove all the personal information to, uh, to respect privacy. So there is no breach for any data. We'll clean the data and take only data points of the body. So if, for example, I'm doing this movement, you will see just my joint. And those are movements that we will interpret and say, what is, what's the meaning of those movements? And then it goes here, and the therapist will have that information. So if I am falling here, cameras somewhere here will tell, oh, there is a body falling. Those data points will get here. We do the artificial intelligence to say that was a falling or tipping, and that's sent to the therapist. So we have this digital infrastructure platform for now. That is under, actually, it is developed by all the RD work or the computer science will happen here. So one and three are ready, and two is kind of ongoing process with my research. So here is some of applications. So we had the patients in Vancouver, which is two hour flights from my home city now. And uh, my students, summer students, was uh, analyzing herself walking in the house. So we have access to walking uh, data. Uh, and here we have uh, another student, actually local students in Winnipeg in Canada. And she is doing some tasks that we have uh, determined. And we are able to say if she is eating or cooking or drinking or using mobile phone, and if she, if she is sedentary, if we have uh, uh, health promotion people here, we can say, oh, the person is watching TV for an hour, so that's too much. Obviously, we, uh, we throw all the data. We throw in all the data because it's gonna be a lot, of, uh, a lot of gigabytes, right? We keep just the information. This is what we are trying to do and optimize over time. So people expert in AI here would probably understand more the technicalities behind that. So I was approached by the hospital and it's a ter tertiary care facility. And again, that's about research. They have a dementia unit. And in that dementia unit, they have a previous project where they opened the dementia unit for patients. They gave a lot of free more freedom, sorry, for patients. Imagine you are giving more freedom for someone who is living with dementia. So it can be dangerous. People will harm themselves or harm others or health professionals. And sometimes they just harm themselves, for example, with a plan. So I was approached by the hospital, like, you know, 15 minutes from my office, saying, you know, uh, what you can do if you are doing that, like, theoretically in the beginning and mice and stuff. So I told them, okay, what I can do is like a, a computer science person. Binary things, there is an event or there is no event, and tell your people what happened, and you guys do whatever you want with that decision. So we started with event and no event, and then thinking about sending that to the server and the therapist. And we did like focus group and all the uh, uh, research details. We ended up saying that the, that the result will be sent to their system. They have a Vosiera system here, the smart badge, the nurses and the staff, and the uh, uh, dementia unit. And basically they will get information in that Vosiera unit saying something vocal that will tell them that say something happened by room five. So they will take the same system, shut up that message and call someone say, hey, go to room uh, number five now. So there is not rehab application for this, but this is kind of improvement of the processes for all the staff when it comes to dementia people. So the beauty of it, we are giving more freedom for patients with dementia. They can recognize their house, their rooms with photo image of their family, of their childhood, etc. So for that, it's okay. But when it comes to dangerous events, this is how we are planning to monitor them. So overall, after that story about the second box, which is the smart suite, I'm thinking about the future research when we are doing a better cognitive assessment to provide a better cognitive training to promote that ultra-connected model that I'm trying to develop to provide independence for the patients from occupational therapy lenses. I can skip this, I think. So now research program, I'm gonna outline it just because I'm running out of time. So the basic idea I explained it in the beginning, I want our patients to go to home as fast as I can uh, uh, and as best as we, as we can do. Supporting by technologies. The opportunities for that, when we think of technology in the house environment, there is more, uh, more movement. Uh, you know, we can provide actually uh, increased frequency of training, quality of training, and we can cut costs and all disagreement, uh, 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 all, bad, uh, all bad feeling actually by the, by the participants, by the uh, clients actually. So I built three things here, three different inventions. And here I joined Dr. Shabir's opinion about content. We lack opinion in this, uh, 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 sorry, uh, content in this area of investigations. When I'm trying to buy some existing solutions, I am never happy with that because just someone else did it and he's a technologist that did it with what they know to do, not what the system needs, patients need, 
and research needs. There's so many layers. And all those developments, the commonality that we'll see later, is something new and really interesting for us as researchers. It's not about just delivering an intervention. Because yes, we will develop something and therapists will do, will work with their patients and recover them, will help them recover, right? As a researcher, I'm not very interested in that piece because it's kind of the easy part of the game. The hard part is getting data. So all the system that I'm developing will send me data by email or uh, throughout my servers. I, I need data as a researcher. So again, there is a lot of AI in that. So any device that I will show uh, over the next uh, 20 minutes will send me data on my email or server, obviously university things to, uh, for, for safety reasons. So the first one here uh, is a physical training program, upper body, lower body, uh, seated position, upright positions, and we have over 100 uh, videos. Actually, just about video, but it's very uh, interactive and motivational. Here is the replica of the smart suite, and the idea behind, oh, it's back. The, uh, so it's adaptable, safe, faced, and uh, real-time data. This is what I already, you see the cognition in my brain is not okay, sorry about that. So the first program is a combination of VR and tablet. So a combination of physical training here and neurocognitive training in the, smart, in the replica of the smart suite, so in virtual reality. Imagine the patient recovering from that after a three months program, this is what I will show later. The next step, their hand is not recovered yet when it comes to stroke, right? Imagine someone with stroke. So they have no rehabilitation training, physical training, no rehabilitation training, they are done. They can walk, they have a lot of functional abilities, but their hand is not accurate yet. They need a lot of more dexterity for that we will develop that uh, smart hand that you will see later, which is here. So physical uh, uh, activity program, I just explained it. This is about video and people just get motivational message. They send us kind of quick questionnaires and I receive data about that to adjust the program, motivate them and things like that. So you can, uh, please, I cannot read everything. Uh, so uh, please uh, try to probably ask question later. Uh, and uh, the uh, second part is explained is cognitive training, so about time-based activities and event-based activities. This is what we see discrepancies among our participants. So the idea is to study the feasibility, your question, sir. Yes, the feasibility of doing that. So at this point, I cannot be very confident saying, oh, all those technology works. And as a researcher, I don't believe in randomized controlled trials in this field of exploration. One of the speakers yesterday spoke about that. I think RCTs and rehab, when it comes to using technology, will be dinosaurs. There is no room for that. I am part of a committee with the, we have in Canada something called CHR, Canada Institute of Health Research. They have 13 sections of health. In the aging, I am in part of the committee and discussion for later, uh, uh, beyond 2024 actually plan, you know, uh, uh, strat plan, you know, uh, strategic planning. We are moving uh, toward a, um, something that we call uh, person-oriented, probably you'll see in the slides later, person-oriented, research where we will try to remove RCTs because here are just fund research that are RCT based like uh, by physicians. We will move to another model of, 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 of doing research. We just need implementation trial. That was my contribution to the committee. I tend to call those futuristic trials implementation trial. Tell us if it works or not. If we have real life evidence that my patients work and is able to use hand dexterity in my case, that's okay. We don't need to go for another uh, set of RCTs just because some people are fans of RCTs. We think it's sort of the religion that you have to follow by the rules. Actually, it's not. Just it applies for basic sciences, not for something very applied like, like we are doing here. So my first patients here, this is what I'll be presenting, is, you know, had a stroke uh, over the last, uh, within a year or something like this. Uh, live in rural area. Uh, she had to have internet, and uh, I look at that someone kind of controllable somehow. Uh, Implementation, I showed that. I'm trying to skip, sorry. So this is the VR. I want you to see that, please. So this is what patient sees in the replica of the smart suite when they start the day. The idea is that they have about 20 minutes to perform tasks, progressive. We have 24 sessions, and they will do it in a very progressive way. So they start by familiarization. They will train themselves. And then we will introduce financial management, which is a big task that is not, that is overlooked in current rehabilitation now. And, <coughs> and they do a lot of decision making. The idea is to get them to simulate a full day by the last module, which is the 
21 to 24 sessions, we want them to perform a day. Start by your coffee in the morning, end up by, by going to bed. So this is what happens. To your right, this is what I have. So as a researcher or a therapist, I am able to compare what I asked them to do before session or a day before versus what they have done. And this is why, where, we see, where we see all the gaps, all the cognitive gaps that the patients uh, has. So those are the modules. We have four modules, 24 sessions in physical training, 24 sessions in neurocognitive training. Uh, I think I explained that thing. So the idea at the end is to perform a full day within about 20 minutes. That's the target. And my first patient achieved that. So we run some assessments pre, post, and in between. Uh, when we, people who are a gamer here in the room will understand, when we have spasticity, we will uh, click on this like I'm doing here. If I have a spasticity, I'm not able to use this device. In the same way, so we had to tinker something here to neutralize the thumb effect, the spasticity on the thumb, and to uh, enable uh, using a controller. So there is a room to use 3D printing to uh, build a new, you know, like an adapted assistive device, an adapted controller for people with stroke to involve in training that is involving controllers. I, I hope you understood it. So this is my patient. She is in her basement, two hours from the city, in her area, but she has internet. So uh, you see how the how we just adapted, so this is my laptop, you know, laptop dedicated to this research. This is my system, she has a, a tablet. So this is how, how it works. Uh, please forgive me, I can say that we have uh, good evidence now, just with one case, I cannot generalize that, but we have some uh, compensatory technique. We had to, we tried to remove them, we have less compensatory technique, you know, on the shoulder and the hip, uh, but the person now is able to walk, is able to perform a lot of tasks, but still we see some, you know, some uh, inappropriate movements, compensatory movement, right, in, in, in the right shoulder and the right uh, hip. But all the, uh, I can just comment on that, all the physical aspects are, are recovered now, so hopefully. So I cannot generalize again in just one case study. So VR and tablet-based rehabilitation are feasible. Uh, we need to improve our onboarding process simply because we took for granted that everyone is able to involve in VR training program, which is not easy, so there is a patient's education that should, we have done some of that, like two hours training, but onboarding should be reconfigured actually, uh, but we did it by times of COVID-19, so probably we could uh, improve. Uh, the ability to skip exercises that we have provided, actually we, uh, uh, we block training, so we, kind of force patients to follow kind of programming flexible way that was really, really, really uh, 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 appreciated by the patients because they don't feel like a barrier of, oh, I am very bad. They can try something and get back and things like that. Something that we overlooked, and it's my personal fault, uh, we took for granted that the caregiver, you know, her spouse in, in this case, is just here to motivate. And actually we realize it's not at all that. He's almost working full time for her. So as a researcher, I blame myself. I have considered more the caregiver in my calculation, in my, you know, in my, in my work. So my first patient is recovered. Now I'm not happy with her dexterity, and that's why I anticipated IMANS, a hand to rehabilitation platform that is made of a smart glove that you can see in this room as well, that is bilateral, so the therapist has a desktop applications, they can set up the training, they have a bank of information over 100 video, they can bring any video they want from YouTube, or they can tape themselves, you know, whatever, doing tasks, and ship it to that software. So you customize here as therapist, if you are physio here or, P, uh, or OT, you customize your training, you send it in my app, oh sorry, my phone is there, in my, in your, in my app uh, as a patient, I will see what I have to do today, so I don't have to think. I don't see all the program, just what I have to do. I use my mobile phone to engage in that training. And as long as I, am, I click on done, my therapist sees the data. So that's what I'm calling the asynchronous model. Meaning that you guys are therapists, you don't have to be here when I am training. I am using my phone, my device, and I'm doing my business. When you have time to see my data, you will see my data. If now you wanna be there, you just have, I just have to use another device to do telecommunication, which is very basic, outdated today already, just Zoom or Skype, just to uh, diminish the cost of this intervention. So you can use your Skype, everyone has laptop or desktop at home, right? So that's for Skype, Zoom, whatever you use, WhatsApp, whatever, and our device. And that's the another way 
that I enabled of uh, the, another way of, of, of delivering the scale that I enabled, which is synchronous telerehabilitation. So we have synchronous, asynchronous, both works, and we tried them, and it depends on availability of therapists, availability of the patients, and uh, the needs for a specific session. Some sessions don't need the therapist to be here. So this is what it is. Sorry, I'm just scrolling. My mind is not uh, okay today. And uh, here what we can see, this is how it works. And that's two years and a half ago, that model and that thing. So that's my postdoc, Dr. Ali, uh, who is doing things. Uh, we improved by that time. So we are seeing how we can assess the shakiness of the hand and how we can perform uh, things. So for the OTs of the room, I am still giving that OT box. So we have walls and rubber bands and things like that, just to do kind of mixed reality. So we have those things and we have the device. Sorry for the time again. Please give me five minutes. I like those guys, please, yeah, <laughs> please. <laughs> so now go to rehab post pandemic. So again, the model I'm trying to develop is ultra-connected living. How we can keep people in their home, in the place they want to age, in the place they want to receive care, but give them technology that is usable by them. So we look at what happens post-pandemic. Telecare is something you hear about, we know about. Everyone adopted that technology, not because we are smart, just because we are trained over the last 20 years for using Zoom and Skype and phone and things like that. So people are not saying that. We are just, again, transhuman. Mobile phone is part of what we are. So telecare was delivered in an easy way. Now we are facing problems. We have technology literacy. If that, if we have a person, for example, an older person or the oldest old, or the frail people, like six months before death, I don't believe they know how to use uh, WhatsApp. So how to do with those people? So technology literacy is something that we explored with some colleagues here in the room, and we explored that technology literacy is one of key points in adopting technology. The other one is digital health literacy. So now if you are able to use your mobile phone, whatever your age and uh, education and competencies, how about health? What is your understanding of a therapy? What is your understanding of a physician talking to you and things like that? This is another... Uh, 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 highway in research that we should explore, and I think the tendency will go throughout that. We will not just train students and therapists, we will train patients somehow in very um, uh, knowledge translation uh, based uh, uh, way. This is a uh, statement by a therapist actually who tried our technology, and she said that when she practiced at home, she could see exactly what the environments look like, in which someone needs to act, and in which someone wants to act. So that's a therapist that only visited by Skype, a home environments to run a home assessment. And that's new, because in Canada we don't do that. We have to go by, 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 by yourself. So what are the challenges? Challenges from rotation, as explained, people are using teleconsultations because they are trained to do teleconsultations all the time. So when we look at health screening, medical data, and telehealth promotion, those again are the champions. The list is very long are way, beyond, way, way behind, actually, simply, again, because of the digital literacy and digital health literacy. Those are the main challenges that we have here. The other challenge is when we try to perform our administer rehab at home, we have a major problem, which is uh, people should be able to accept it, adhere to it, but we need other resources. Have it, having the technology, having internet, and probably having someone to help with that technology because I cannot, being, I cannot uh, uh, involve in the rehabilitation program and also click on the mouse and things like that. Like myself presenting, I don't want to be the IT guy. The same way, right? So we need the presence of someone, and those are part of the resources. So in terms of technology, three points that we have to consider are the portability of the devices, are the usability of the, design, the devices, and the resources. We have to reduce... Uh, as low as possible resources. We have to have very fancy but easy technology in order for people to adhere to it. So the key, again, I'm not, uh, I'm not gonna talk a lot about it, is education. So patients' education is gonna be the future in this area. So now, a little bit of rehabilitation and the metaverse. I started my speech by talking about the presence, the feeling of presence, and that's gonna be the uh, future. So now think about what I have presented. 
the physical training component, the neurocognitive training component, the hand rehabilitation, rehabilitation component. Now all those, I can stop my talk here actually, but I will not do, just bring it to the metaverse. Have it in a computer, plug and play, train. I can be in Canada, I can train you. I can be working with you here and train someone in another country. Because it's just online, we can do that. Technically we can do that. So we have a lot of benefits. People will escape and relief from the stress of life, will invoke tempor uh, temporary pleasure, things like that beyond the rehabilitation services. But we have some issues. The National Library of Medicine in, in, in America had found an association between uh, addiction to gaming uh, and depression and all, all, all those things. So probably we, can, uh, we have to consider that as well. In terms of research, Metaverse opened a new area. Again, I was talking about RCT. I'm not finding RCT in our field in rehab when it comes to using technology. Uh, RCT is something that is not adequate at all. So if we go for Metaverse, we will have faster and fewer and safer implementation files. Remember this word, I'm trying to work on something, force actually, the use of the word implementation trials instead of randomized controlled trials which start to be dinosaur in this specific field. It applies to other fields. So the metaverse is not about rehab, it has other things. It uh, promotes socializations, entertainment, fun. Fun in rehab is very good. All people, uh, if you are a rehab expert here, you know tasks are repetitive, it's labor intensive and all those things. Metaverse make them funny, gamified, which helps a lot and promotes the adherence to things. Uh, I'm not finishing my talk here, but I have to acknowledge all the work that has been done so far. So I'm funded by University of Manitoba, Research Manitoba, a uh, couple of hospitals, uh, federal and provincial uh, uh, level, a lot of foundations, and here uh, private companies. So when I started this research program, I was thinking about col uh, controlled environments and community-based. I wanted a combination of both. So I ended up having uh, knowledge base. Uh, building guidelines for therapists and for patients and for, for, for the families, all those are indirect uh, benefits. But I also build direct uh, uh, benefits, which is R&D, some inventions, some technologies that exist, and some uh, uh, evidence that those technologies work. The future of this work will be training the therapist, the students, the patients, in order for all those stakeholders to be able to involve the new area of using technology in rehabilitations. And at the end of the day, if we train people here, it will go back to better intervention and keep people home in an ultra-connected way. So my model would succeed only if I succeed in training people, whether in continuing education model or young students here, they will do those interventions, give me feedback to improve my work and get, keep people home. This is what I wanna do. This is the ultra-connected model that I'm trying to develop. So it's all about innovation. Sorry, I can make it bigger here. It's all about innovation, so we have the resources. We are using collective creativity as research and therapists and patients. We have the infrastructure, digital and uh, uh, physical. TechWatch is something easy to do, but innovation is about consensus. So now, that's a big challenge, by big challenge, how to achieve a consensus. Again, I explained it in CHR, Institute of Aging in Canada. We are building, this will be hopefully coming soon. We are pushing politically toward that. We'll be talking about person-oriented research that bring clinicians, a person and family decision maker and researcher together. So any researcher working on the uh, aging research in Canada will not adhere to this if it gets applied by the Ministry of Health at the federal level, will not be funded. So that's the new approach of, of delivering uh, personal-oriented uh, care through person-oriented research. So what I'm doing toward that direction, I am bringing here 20 older adults from the city where I live and uh, local uh, experts, so professors and clinicians and, uh, and uh, technologists, and we're trying to design and co-create the, uh, actually design, uh, sorry, create a research roadmap for technology for assisted living. So this is about discussions. I am bringing people in the smart suite, like, you know, like a museum. <laughs> That's why I call it that, that way. Like a museum, explore the museum, understand everything so that people are aware about the possibilities and discuss about the, 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 uh, the roadmap. So once I hear about the older adults first as an aging in place initiatives, I will validate by the expert and then validate by the, by the older adults. So the same older adults here will come back here. So we have the same 20 
coming uh, back. So three hour session, three hour session, three hour sessions. So my commitment as a researcher is to move forward with whatever contracts I obtain from my other others here as, representat as a rep representative group of the community. What we have here in Kuwait, so I work with you guys even though I'm far away. Uh, we are exploring, actually we are thinking about the roadmap of the use of technology and artificial, sorry I have a problem with my neck, uh, artificial technology and artificial intelligence uh, in the Kuwait health ecosystem. So we are doing surveys and Dr. Hamza Al-Shawaf is pushing towards QR codes so you have them in these screens there or just capture them here. We are interviewing faculty, interviewing students and residents and hopefully in the future healthcare professional. We want data from Kuwait City or the state of Kuwait about how people perceive technology, how people use technology, and what people expect from the technology. The more you provide us information, the more we're able to design a roadmap. We don't want to just buy technology and throw it in the, in the cabinetry in the rooms. We want a technology that will serve based on your needs, you guys, students, faculty, and clinicians, if I have clinicians here in the room. Another international work, actually, I'm part of uh, Edel Phi projects uh, with the same uh, 15 countries that I explained in the beginning, and that's led by Leiden University in, uh, in, 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 Holland, in the Netherlands. And again, this is a draft. Please don't copy anything from it. We are trying to redraw the journey of patients when it comes to uh, being involved in a e-health intervention. We don't know what patients do, right? Over time, now we know what patient does when they come to a hospital and they go back home. We know we are an emergency room, firefighter, we fix a problem and we, we ship them to the house. This is what we know. When it comes to the health, we have no idea. So we gather at 15 countries and we say, okay, come on guys, we have to decide what's the journey, how, to, how we have to tell, what is kind of story we can tell patients when they come to us. This is your new journey in e-health. If they ask their neighbors and the friends and colleagues, they will understand the old school things, the system that we have today. So we are trying to draw that toward that direction, again, to improve the patient's education and make patients aware about technology, but also aware about, about their journey. They cannot sign on, <laughs> sign on something they don't understand. So we are trying to draw that uh, journey now. Two, three minutes. So to build that map, I believe in research again. I don't have to argue that anymore, but more importantly in education and service. I need service to feed research. I need research to feed service and vice versa. All that have, has to loop in again and under the underpinning paradigm that I explained in the beginning, which is going from transhuman to post-human. Uh, in order for that journey to work, I'm running out of time. In order for a journey to work, I can explain so many things, but the most important things is ethics. I'm not speaking about ethics when it, oh, sorry. I'm not speaking about ethics, uh, I'm not speaking about ethics when it comes to applying for ethics board. I'm speaking about our ethics as researcher, students, practitioner, uh, faculties, in terms of the, uh, of the future. I believe we have to think of a social model, actually, of care. If you go with technology, we are not just, sorry, we are not just intervening with the patients, we are changing people's life, you are asking them to have a technology. In my case as a researcher, and that's fascinating, I am given a tablet and VR system to a patient. They leave it in their house for three months. I, I don't find it ethical to ask them to give it back to me because I'm cheap researcher. What I'm doing, a contract with the university, if the patients want that, they go with it because people get attached to it. They want to play with it. They want to play, use it. So I believe in that social responsibility. So we have to consider that as a group. We don't know how to do that. In my case, just a contract with the university, whatever equipment I ship to people home, it stays with home. Another nice example of that, my patients had to move from one city to another city to visit a friend who is sick. She cannot take the VR system. She was calling me, hey, I mean, I cannot use uh, VR for a week. No problem, take the tablet. So the tablet now is with her. Now she's back to work. She's a doctor, by, by the way. Now she is leading a department and back to work with the stroke by telling people, I have a tablet. Now it's my lunchtime. I'm going to train 15 minutes for Amin. I'm like, hey, yes, research is useful now. <laughs> so another thing, because Dr. Al-Shawaf talked to me about education. Education is something 
we should consider when it comes to metaverse. I believe in that. So this is a model that I'm trying actually, I'm hunting for grants actually, where I'm thinking about training, and researchers will understand me, that frustration of getting funded. Uh, I'm trying to get the therapist to train students or residents or you know uh, any trainee here in the VR. So, and or probably in the metaverse. So the idea, whatever content you have, for example, how you interview a patient. You can be a senior person, so this person. You can have your trainees and they are seeing a video or VR or whatever we want to build as a content. We have to build that content and they will be managing that by themselves. Uh, VR and metaverse, you can be multi-users, right? So you as a trainer, as a faculty, as responsible or something, whatever you want, you are here observing something in real life, doing something in real life, but in a fake environment, which is a, uh, uh, a training. So if you teach your students how to interview just classroom, like what I'm saying, but if you want to really adjust everything, maybe that's the way to do. It can be applicable, for example, for patient interview, but you can think about 20 or 30 different applications. So to give you an example of how education can be done, this is an example, again, it's not a commercial for people who just came in now. I am not a salesperson. This is just for demonstration purposes. So I am consulted for this program, and this is in dentistry. So this is, this is an advanced teaching and learning platform that complements convention methods. Just because of running, I'm running out of time, I'm going to uh, let you see this. Introducing Denteach, an advanced teaching learning platform that complements traditional teaching methods by utilizing Industry 4.0 technology. Our proprietary technology seamlessly integrates robotics and remote augmented reality learning for a future-proof teaching environment. Denteach seamlessly integrates and synchronizes the video, audio, feel, and posture of real-world scenarios by using our DT Rightway Dental Articulator. Instructors using Denteach will be able to pre-record their lessons and more fairly grade their students by having the capability of measuring over 80 different KPIs. Students will also want to use Denteach because it gives them the ability to practice remotely while simultaneously enhancing their learning experience. Students and instructors can also use our DT Prep Scanner, which allows them to see the results of their own work with an extremely high degree of accuracy because of its laser measuring system. Those are just some of the benefits that both schools and students will find when they use Denteach. If you have any questions, we would love to help. Thanks for watching. Introducing the new DT Prep Scanner, a fast, objective, and accurate way to grade students' dental preps. This compact and portable device eliminates the need for traditional measuring tools by using our laser-based measuring technology. To use our prep scanner, simply place the tooth you wish to have measured into the device. Select which sides you wish to have scanned and hit the scan button. Once the scan is complete, students and instructors can use our interactive software to view both a 2D and 3D model of their prep, as well as take measurements to help assess their work. So that was it. Again, uh, I apologize for uh, this extension. I wanted to uh, present in a faster way, but again, my, my brain is, it's 2 p.m. in my, 2, 2 a.m. in my brain, so sorry about that. So this prog all the program is user-centered, obviously. I see opportunities for globalization and inclusion in research. I'm thinking about underdeveloped country or just collaboration between countries. I think running, running implementation trials between countries are doable now that we have the metaverse. Uh, I don't believe that we have a lot of weaknesses. If you believe that you can use uh, the uh, World Web, uh, the www dot something securely, you will be able to use metaverse securely. The problem again, just ethics. It's not ethics in terms of getting ethics by university to run your research. Is the social responsibility that we all hold in terms of delivering care. We should, we should consider about that. We should, we should consider that. So that was the ultra connected model that I am trying to develop. Thanks so much. If you have any questions, and if I have time, I would Doctor, have time. We, we have time for two questions from the audience. Anyone wants to ask a question? Uh, Dr. Sabi, just take a question. Yeah, actually, it was very informative information, but the one big thing which I want to know about from where we are receiving.
go to the patient, whether we have living lab, like we have, or you go to the hospital, the department of geriatrics, you recruit the patient, so how does it work? So in general, I believe in the living lab, I, I totally agree. The way I'm doing that is I work a lot with radio station and TV. I do vulgarization. I explain the same thing, but in very uh, lay language, just to you know, increase awareness, awareness among the general public. So uh, this is uh, hopefully something very accessible in, in, in my environment. So I use media to raise awareness about technology because people don't know technology. They know just iPhone and the Apple Store, to be honest. So in this case, it's, it's you know, the, that person just attended the conference. He's a doctor. I, uh, I am not in Canada, so I can say that because she's famous, I cannot say that in Canada. Uh, she's a doctor and she just attended the conference and one of the uh, persons uh, presenting, she asked the question, so, oh, maybe in your case you should talk to that person because you are living in that area and, and that person was me. So just gave me a call in my lab, to be honest. But I do believe in living lab environments. I do a lot uh, of collaboration now. I work with the province of Quebec and province of Alberta and actually I haven't presented about this if you wanted this to, uh, I have time. Right? If you wanted this to be successful, personally, I don't believe that we have to force healthcare system if the healthcare system is not willing to implement it. What we are trying to develop in Canada, in my case, I'm developing that. I believe in social enterprise, so we can get the same intervention to be delivered by non, you know, NFO, uh, not for profit organizations because they are eligible for that, they have cost for, they have budget for that, they have resources for that. So personally as a researcher, those things that, it's, I'm developing ultra-connected model of delivering care. Healthcare system is 20 years behind that. How you want me to wrap things up and, and force things? I cannot, I'm not a politician, so, and I don't have that power. So what I'm doing, just sending two things. So now I'm thinking to, uh, I'm working with um, uh, my city, another city in East Canada, uh, the city in West Canada, to develop care for uh, SCI in the West, uh, spinal cord injury in the West, and um, multiple sclerosis in the East. So this is what I'm doing, and those are NFO. This is how we can get patients and treat them beyond uh, the outside the healthcare system. Second yeah, question. Dr. Amin, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. I really enjoyed it. Dr. Amin, thank you for uh, really collaborating with Kuwait University and our faculty and students. But I have a question, why don't you uh, also include the, the policy makers or the stakeholders in your survey? Because, you know, uh, for the long run, our students, they will be graduating and they will be in the Ministry of Health, right? Yes. And the healthcare system here is different than Canada. I know. So, yeah. So this is my I point. know that yeah. this is a wonderful question. Yeah. In my experience, I was thinking like that in Canada. And when you go to political level things, you want to talk? you are making people trust you as a researcher. So hey, I have a PhD, I have competency on this. They will not trust you. So politicians work with the democracy, right? So now I'm using research to build that democracy. Your population, students, faculty, therapists, want this. So you politician, click on the buzzer. <laughs> this is how I believe now. Because again, I have a lot of experience with that. When you engage stakeholders, high level stakeholders right away, they are not aware about that and you are trying to force something and they cannot. They, they hear me, this is what happens over months, and they, I mean, I cannot change the system. Now if we go, is, if we flip it and go by the democratic process, saying this is what people want, this is what people need, this is what people sign it on, and we can even bring evidence from people. This is evidence, this is scientific evidence that we are bringing. All the surveys that you will fill in if you contribute to our surveys are uh, standardized surveys, so our validated survey is not just, we are not just having that for fun, this is publishable data that we have to. So in this way we can uh, uh, develop together the roadmap for healthcare in Kuwait, we can do that very easily. So again, I don't know the uh, political uh, structure here, but I feel myself now with my experience, more confident going with the confidence. By all the stakeholders, except the decision maker, saying this is what people need, this is what you do with your boss in any work, right? So this is what people need, Please help me fix this issue. This is how I deal with it. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank Again, my apologies for stretching time. Thank you. Let me just say one thing about your workshop. Yes. So Professor Amin has a workshop today, W6. We still have uh, very few seats available in the workshop. Please register if you um, Want to hear so, more about his so basically, I have uh, I'm demoing some of the technology in the room just to your right, and in the PM I have a workshop and it's going to be extended extension of that. 
some of we could bring data from that workshop. I want to hear from you. It's a very interactive workshop. So I'm trying to learn from you guys what you want in Kuwait, right? So I'm just a moderator of that workshop. So we will be able to bring some data. Again, you know, I'm not against politicians. I'm trying to make politicians make decisions based on evidence rather than of my wish or your wish. This is what I'm trying to do. So please attend this workshop. I would be glad to uh, work with you uh, this PM. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll take a 15 minute break. Uh, please help yourself to refreshments at the Uh, Hartford and uh, master and his PhD in industrial engineering on data sciences. Uh, he worked uh, in Siemens in Kuwait for eight years. Um, he is currently executive manager in the Kelp Bank in Kuwait and he's going to talk to, uh, today about the decision making uh, for the a surgical treatment for the theater cath uh, using the uh, SRM. And uh, we would like to welcome him, and I will leave the floor for him. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I hope uh, you are enjoying this uh, great conference, and I also would like to welcome our uh, guest uh, from abroad uh, again. Um, and uh, I am very honored to be here today and uh, talk about one of the research that I did during my um, PhD. Uh, as uh, uh, our friend mentioned, I'm not coming from a medical background. Uh, I went through different phases through uh, in my academic life as well as my uh, professional life. However, I have been always, I mean, for the last 10 years, I've been uh, dealing with uh, uh, applications of machine learning and artificial intelligence in different areas. I applied these techniques in uh, different industries. Uh, and one of the uh, researches that I did during my study was, is actually the topic of my um, talk today. Uh, so when I was uh, in, in the University of Michigan, uh, there was a funded project, and they had some data from patients uh, with, uh, with a rotator cuff tear injury. So we wanted to, so the objective was to use machine learning uh, to detect uh, whether these patients need a, a surgery or not. So this is the agenda for today uh, in a nutshell. I will start with the introduction to this uh, topic or to this uh, research uh, work. Uh, I will talk about the objective challenges. <clears throat> we go a little bit uh, detail in, and technical about uh, one of the uh, famous uh, problems in the field of machine learning, which is matrix completion. I will try to be very, um, you know, quickly pass this just for you to understand what's going on in this field. What are the hot uh, research areas? Uh, and then we talk about how we build the model, and we will conclude, inshallah. So, uh, what the motivation for this research, as I mentioned, uh, was that uh, rotator cuff tear, if we have someone from physical therapy, they would know that rotator cuff injury is one of the uh, common cause of uh, pain and disability among adults. And uh, according uh, to uh, and information I extracted in 2015, about two million people in the United States visited doctors because of this problem, because of their rotator cuff injury. So <clears throat> out of these two million, about 75% after the first visit, they are referred, to, or to, so the physician, the doctor, refers the uh, patient to, uh, to physical therapy. However, however uh, these 75%, not all of them uh, get, uh, let's say, cured uh, by the physical therapy. So among the 75% who go to physical therapy, about 45% end up having a surgery, meaning this physical therapy period, which is, uh, you know, sometimes it uh, lasts for months, uh, is not actually, um, uh, does not 
uh, treat them or does not treat the injury. Uh, so, the, so this means that there is a huge waste of time, money, uh, energy, effort, because going to physical therapy, um, you know, requires you have to pay, and uh, the insurances, uh, you know, uh, are, are mad. So at the end of the day, if it's not helpful, why should we go through this uh, time period? So the hope and the objective as of this research was to eliminate this, uh, let's say, gap and kind of try to predict whether uh, a patient that visits the doctor with this um, uh, rotator cuff injury, whether will end up having a surgery or not ahead of time and before going for to physical therapy phase. So uh, we wanted to build a machine learning algorithm using a history of patients uh, and uh, to, to, um, to predict, as I mentioned, uh, that whether a patient with a rotator cuff injury ends up having a surgery or not. Uh, so after we uh, got the data, we saw uh, there are multiple challenges and let's say, mm, because if you deal with any kind of real world applica application, uh, you will see that there are challenges come up. Uh, usually when, if you take a machine learning course, uh, the data set and the, you know, the data set that uh, are given or presented to students are very nice and uh, nicely structured. But in real world, unfortunately, this is not the case. So you have to uh, deal with these challenges and problems. So one of the major problems that, and challenges that uh, we faced uh, when we received the data was that about 35% of the data was missing. Uh, and that's uh, due to various reasons. Because some of the data was, uh, you know, was collected using surveys. Uh, and another part was you know, the actual uh, treatment results. So that was the biggest channel uh, challenge. Uh, also, we had about 65 uh, variables, 65 factors in the data. We needed to eliminate uh, the 65 factors to come up with uh, the variables that are re really useful for the model to learn and to pr uh, for the prediction. And uh, we always had, uh, I mean, when we received the data, we only had 244 cases, 244 patients. And, uh, there is a rule of thumb in any machine learning uh, algorithm. The more data you have, the more data points, the more observations you have, the better your life is, or the easier your life is. So 244, I wouldn't say it's very small, but it's not very good enough. We wish to have a thousand and more, okay? So, um, so we, deal, we have to deal with these challenges and the first, challenge, as I mentioned here, was the missing uh, data. So we had the data about 35% was missing. S so we had to fill these uh, uh, missing entries. And this brings us to a problem called metrics completion. Uh, this is a very uh, you know, active and hot area of research in the field of machine learning. Uh, it's basically metrics completion means uh, the process of estimating unobserved entries of a metrics uh, using or based on observed entries. So we have an incomplete metrics. We have some numbers. Some of them are missing. We want to estimate what is uh, or we want to predict what is the value of these uh, missing entries. <coughs> so it's very... Uh, still, you know, mathematicians attack this problem in different ways and it's still a very active area of research. And one of the, uh, if people are in this field, uh, once uh, they hear this problem, um, this Netflix uh, prize or Netflix uh, competition comes into my mind. So what is Netflix problem? It will just take you back a bit from medical uh, field. So in 2009 and before, you know, Netflix used to be selling uh, DVDs or renting DVDs. Uh, so you take the DVD and then uh, they ask you based on your uh, feedback, they recommend what is the best or movie that you like. Right now, everything they, you know, they quit this uh, uh, DVD rental 
uh, and everything is online, but this is, sti this is still there. So, uh, but Netflix had a problem, and this problem is shown here. They had a recommendation system, which was very powerful, uh, based on user behavior. They would recommend what's the best likely movie that you would uh, probably or most likely buy, okay? But when you just think about putting users on one axis, as you can see here, uh, I don't know if this is working, yeah. Users, if we, put, we were putting about uh, the users here and putting the movies because they had about seven, uh, 17,000 or 177, 17,000 movies, uh, not all users watch all movies, right? So user one has watched movie three, movie five, and let's say this last movie, and he has rated it, but he hasn't watched all these other movies, that's why it becomes uh, missing. And the same thing applies for other users. So Netflix uh, wanted, if you want, they want to build a strong uh, recommendation system or recommendation model, they want or they wish to have uh, a complete metrics like this. So the, the, the problem is what would be the rating of this user if that user have watched movie one based on the uh, feature and characteristic of that movie. So they uh, you know, opened a big competition. You can Google it, it's very famous. And uh, about, I think, 20,000 teams uh, applied for this uh, um, competition, and uh, somebody came up with a very, very smart solution, and they won the $1 million uh, prize, okay? With that being said, uh, here I just talk a bit. I will not go into details what was their solution, uh, but uh, they, uh, they used a very, uh, uh, very smart and uh, uh, advanced factorization to factorize that metrics and using singular, singular value thresholding, they came up with this uh, amazing approach. Again, without going into details, uh, they basically solved this optimization problem to, uh, to estimate the missing entries. Um, so it's an uh, iterative algorithm, tries to find uh, entries that are most likely, uh, you know, as we mentioned, they are most likely rating if that user had um, uh, rated that movie. Uh, so this is uh, best uh, taught in mathematics class, so I will just skip these. Uh, for us, so we adopted this approach. We changed it a little bit because uh, what they uh, assumed in their solution was that was that the, their their solution uh, takes these ratings and doesn't change them and only estimates the missing ones. But for us, we changed this algorithm and we assumed that and the reason was that we know that there is a noise in our uh, metrics. We know that when uh, a patient uh, rates or answers the survey, the answer is not exact. The answer is, uh, is not 100% accurate. So uh, for that, to take care of that, we um, changed this equation a little bit so that these entries, so the, the solution tries to find the maximum similarity while uh, doing what's so-called the uh, norm minim minimization, okay? So doing that, this is our uh, alternative uh, approach. And with that, we solved this problem and we uh, actually miss or filled the missing entries for our metrics. So here is a snapshot of our data set. As you can see, these are all missing variables or missing entries, uh, a closer look. And here, of course, we have to do some pre-processing uh, we got rid of uh, the unrelated data and encoded the categorical variables. <clears throat> and after doing that, out of 65 variables, we ended up with having six, uh, 30 uh, variables. And after applying that technique, here is our complete data set. 
and you can see here, these are exact numbers. After we apply this technique, uh, the exact numbers are not exact anymore. We kind of take care of, uh, of, of the fact that these numbers might not be 100% accurate. So we complete the data set, and after that, uh, so this snapshot is showing uh, uh, more, it's, it's, it's a comparison between the, uh, the, the missing or the original data set with the estimated data set. So for example, uh, this value, uh, 0 0.25, is in the, uh, in the original data set. After we recovered, after applying the algorithm, uh, this value becomes 0 0.27, so added some noise. Okay, and uh, this 0.5 became 0.51, and so on. And the zeros that you can see here are the missing values, which are estimated by these uh, numbers, with the hope that these are, um, with high probability, these are the real values for this incomplete data set. So that was the biggest challenge that we uh, spent a lot of time finding a solution for it. After that, uh, so this, uh, um, and graph is showing you uh, here three heat maps. On the left is the original metrics. You can see that a lot of them are zero. And uh, here on the, on the very right is the recovered metrics uh, with, the, with taking care of the uh, fact that some of the exact values might have had some noise. Uh, so after that, we had to, so we ended up having 30 variables. Uh, we further reduced our data set uh, using a technique called backward el elimination. We uh, selected uh, 13 features or 13 variables out of these 30. These are our uh, selected variables or the last, or the candidates that uh, survived in our model. So surgery side, gender, diagnos uh, diagnosis codes, and so on are our uh, th 13 variables. So these variables are fed into uh, our model. Before doing that, we wanted to visualize uh, the, the data set. Of course, as you know, when we have, if we have only two variables, we can um, just make a plot, 2D plot, and visualize our uh, data. The best we can do is three variables uh, because we, have, we can do a three-dimension plot, but once the dimension goes beyond three, uh, there is no way to uh, visualize our data. Um, just, we just have the li limitation. So that's why what they do is um, a, a technique called dimensionality reduction. So again, it's a technique to extract the most useful information uh, from these 15 dimensional metrics uh, to, so you, you reduce it to three-dimensional metrics while keeping most of the, uh, most of the information in that recovered uh, data. So with, after doing that, this is how it looks like. This is how our uh, data set looks like. So red is, as you can see, the, the red uh, dots here or the red circles are the patients who did not uh, do a surgery, and the, uh, the blue circles are the ones that ended up having the surgery. So you can see from here kind of that there is something that separates them. So this is what the machine learning algorithm tries to do. Tries to find a way to separate these two classes so that given the input, we can predict whether uh, the patient uh, requires a surgery or not. So doing that, uh, we go to next step, we go to the classification. We use the technique called, uh, called uh, SVM, support vector machine. Uh, again, I'm not going to uh, go into details about what is this algorithm and uh, the, the, the theory behind it, but it's one of the um, common, commonly used algorithms in classification problems. So, uh, we, uh, we, ha we found the optimal values for the parameters of our uh, model, and uh, applying the algorithm into uh, our data set, this is the result. So as you can see here, this is so-called the confusion matrix. Here is the actual outcome. 
and here is the predicted outcome. So the actual outcome uh, has yes and no, meaning ended up having the surgery uh, or not having the surgery. And this is the, uh, the result of our model. And you can see that our model for about 60, with 65% accuracy was able to detect whether the patient uh, needed a surgery or not. So out of uh, 249 uh, per patients, we had, uh, uh, or 244 patients, we had 103 uh, correct classification for the patients who did not have a surgery, and 56, um, 56 uh, cases for the patients who actually had the surgery. Uh, and of course, we had an error. We had a marginal error of about 45, uh, 35%, okay? Uh, so this is a result from uh, SVM with so-called the RBF kernel. We applied another method, uh, same SVM with a different uh, type of kernel, and the result was very similar, but of course the RBF kernel outperformed the polynomial kernel. Okay, and so after having the machine learning uh, model, the first question comes in mind is that uh, I don't need this black box. I need something that's explainable for me. Okay, now you tell me you can predict what is the, the outcome, but what factors uh, uh, led to this decision? So for that, uh, there is something so-called the, uh, the importance, feature importance, and uh, here you can see that what were the top 10 uh, variables that led to this decision, whether the patient needs a surgery or not. And uh, no surprise that this work physical score, I think it's a Western, um, I forgot, but it has to do with the, with the, uh, the health, yeah. Uh, yes, it, I mean, people in the field of physical therapy, they very much know that. So, it has to do directly with the, uh, with the health of that, uh, physical health of that, of that uh, patient. So it turned out to be the highest or the most important variable. And you can see the rest, uh, period of BMI, duration of symptoms in months, uh, or gender, uh, whether it's a male or female, and so on. Okay? So that gives us some uh, idea or, uh, or makes it clearer that what are the factors that uh, are important to take that decision, but another step is to, because remember this, these models are, uh, let's say, physician assistant. They are not used to just take the final decision. Uh, and for that, uh, we can extract the probability because the outcome of this model is a probability of whether yes or, or no, okay? And uh, for that, we can extract the probability. So for example, for this, uh, I just, I'm just showing you for 10 patients. And you can see for this patient number one, the probability of no, which is in blue, is about 65%. And probability of yes is less than 40%. Okay, so this is another tool or an extra uh, step that a physician can, um, get, can help and assist the physician for taking the decision. Meaning, if the probability of having the surgery is very high versus uh, not having the surgery, maybe the uh, physician decides to uh, refer uh, that patient for surgery, and so on. But, you know, this is another step for, uh, for assisting the physician. So, uh, with that, I would like to conclude. Uh, so we developed here a robust uh, machine learning algorithm to uh, detect whether a patient with rotator cuff injury ends up having a surgery or not. And as I mentioned, this can be utilized as a physician's assistant for taking the, uh, the proper decision. And of course, uh, utilizing this can save a lot of, can save hospitals, uh, patients, doctors, insurance companies, and so on. 
uh, can save money, time, and effort, and uh, avoiding uh, uh, unnecessarily spending unnecessarily money uh, for uh, physical therapy. And uh, with that, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much, and I would like to. I would be happy if there is any question. Uh, thank you, Dr. Haider, for such a great talk. Machine learning is uh, always intriguing and fascinating yes. topic. Yeah. Uh, now we will uh, load the QR. So you should scan the QR for the CME points, yeah? Please scan if you are interested to receive your CME certificate. This cumulative is dated at the end of the conference in one year. Now, uh, we should welcome uh, Dr. Adari Abdullah Zaabi from Oman. Uh, she is assistant professor uh, of cancer molecular biology at the Department of Human and Clinical Anatomy. And she is a course coordinator of uh, many modules in the same topic. She is specialized in ca cancer molecular biology. She will talk about very intriguing topic for me and the radiology departments. It's uh, about uh, radiomics. Thank you, doctor. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Kif uh, al This is Dr. Adari from uh, Sultanate of Oman, uh, from Sultan Qaboos University. Is my voice clear? It is? Okay. I hope it will not be so loud. What about now? Is it clear? Okay, so first of all, I would like to invite you to try Omani Halwa. I don't know if any of you has tried it before. I brought some, so I'll keep it here. Uh, Oman is very famous for Halwa. Uh, I don't want to call it sweet. It is Halwa. It is Halwa. It should be called Halwa. So uh, everyone is welcome to come and try some. Uh, I, ho I hope you will like it. It's not healthy, by the way. <laughs> it's a lot of sugar and ghee with uh, starch, but it's very yummy. And it's small, small bites, so it will not harm. Uh, my talk will be about radiomics, and uh, radiology is one of the medical fields that has been claimed to be highly affected by AI. But it, it will be affected, but there is no way that uh, machines can replace physicians. So uh, radiologists over here, uh, you'll be there still. Machines cannot operate by themselves. So. Um, Let's go through the, the presentation. So uh, first of all, uh, um, my talk is mainly about um, implication of radi radiomics in oncology. And what do uh, physicians and oncologists need to know about it? Uh, first of all, let's see how radiology is important in oncology field. Actually, uh, um, oncologists cannot, cannot decide on treatment or stage of a disease of a cancer 
without doing any radiological imaging. So th it is very vital for uh, the treatment of cancer patients from the beginning till the end. And as the patient is in follow-up, it's all uh, done through radiological imaging. Uh, let's take an example. For example, if you uh, see the staging of cancer, once the patient is diagnosed with cancer, he will go through a different uh, radiological imaging in order to define what stage he is in. And then once the stage is, de is defined, uh, he will receive a treatment. And that treatment needs to be followed up in order to see was there any response or was there no response. And that will be done purely through clinical and radi radiological uh, criteria. And if you see here the survival of patients according to stage, this is specifically for colorectal cancer, but actually it can be applied to all types of cancer. So the earlier the stage of cancer, the better, the earlier the stage of cancer, the better survival, and the later the stage is the, uh, giving a worse prognosis. And if you see treatment-wise, patients who are in, sta in the early stages before stage three, they are usually receiving mainly surgical and uh, surgical treatment, and they don't go through the burden of chemotherapy and other invasive and harsh uh, treatment. But as the patient uh, reach a stage of three and four, which are very invasive, specifically stage four, they will go through all of this very harsh and toxic management. And at this stage where the problem is, because currently in the Gulf region and worldwide, but more in the Gulf region, majority of cases of colorectal cancer are diagnosed at this stage because we don't have a proper screening programs. So these patients are suffering from a lot of side effects and very bad scenario. Therefore, radiomics should play a role here in order to predict, to predict their response and to predict uh, who is going into um, uh, fast or rapid progression of the disease without receiving toxic uh, therapy. And this where we are talking about, so currently what is happening for a patient who will receive chemotherapy, he will undergo very frequent CT scanning in order to see how that chemotherapy is uh, benefiting that patient. And pu purely they are concentrating on the size of the tumor. So if you see here, this is the liver, this is CT scan, and here is the, a tumor in the liver, which is a metastatic lesion, and there is another one here. So how they are, uh, um, evaluating such response is by what is called the resist uh, criteria, which sees the uh, tumor. Is it dis disappearing? Is there a reduction in the size? Is there a, re a reduction in the size more than 30%? Is there a reduction less than 30%? Or is there, is, is there an increase in the size for almost 20% and more? And that will determine if the patient needs further treatment or that will indicate he's responding to, to, to the current therapy. So if you compare these two uh, images, these are from the same patient. This is pre-chemotherapy and this is post-chemotherapy. And mainly the radiologists and oncologists, they are mainly concentrating on the size of the tumor that they see in the CT scan. So the patient, the tumor in the liver was this size and it was very um, um, like um, not well demarcated. And then after the therapy, the tumor you can see by, by your eyes that the tumor is shrinking. And based on this, the doctor or the oncologist can uh, d define that patient as patient who is responsive to treatment and either they will continue the same existing treatment or they, mo they will move to uh, a less uh, harmful or less toxic uh, therapy. But is this enough? Actually, uh, studies or clinically, this has not been enough. And they sh they, 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 the, there was lots of cases where this is very typical scenario, but then they don't respond further. Either they deteriorate very fast, which means that there's something missing. And there's this question that usually uh, raised up in every uh, MDT, where can these images provide extra information? And here where radiomics will play a role. So um, uh, according to uh, um, a message, uh, uh, it's a statement published in 2015 by Gillies, who, who said, images are not pictures, they are data. So if you see the, this deer, you can see the ear of the deer. As we see it by our naked eye, we can see just an ear. But if you go further and magnify it, it's made of pixels. And, this, and these pixels are readable, and there are lots of data that can be concluded from these if there is, if there is 
uh, if there is like an uh, algorithm that can determine the pattern that is hidden out there. Um, in fact, uh, and this was the, the birth of radiomics, and in fact, it was added into the omics uh, family. And as I don't know if anyone is aware about the omics family, which includes genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and even Stanford University, they added something very interesting, and they call it screenome to add it into omics, and it includes the screenome. What are the things that are, you are playing with in your screens? plus your uh, total omics, which is genome, transcriptome, proteome, metabolome, and epigenome, microbiome, environment, and sociome. This is a lot of ohms. But actually, this is the, the, how they envision the future healthcare, where all of this can, all of them can be translated into very personalized and precise medicine. So is this in you? Actually, it's not in you, and it, it, it goes back uh, to 1973. There were lots of uh, reports uh, back there where they uh, show that radiological images, they have lots of hidden data that needs to be deciphered. But what is in you nowadays? Why, why it is blooming now as a new term and as, as radiomics and more publications is going on? Actually, it started in 2012, where I don't know if you are aware about this competition. It's a competition called ImageNet, uh, where there are almost 1,000 pictures uh, they, are, they are there online, and they, the, the competition is asking for people to um, construct uh, algorithms and programs in order to identify which picture, uh, the, every picture belongs to what. Is it an animal? Is it um, a landscape? Is it a tree? Is it um, a human being? And uh, the, the competition is run every year, and in 2012, specifically, there is a team from Canada who were able to get a very high score compared to previous years, and that's because uh, they have discovered or they have made what is called cumulated, cumulated neural network, and from there, radiomics was blooming. And since then, the publications uh, about radiomics applications in healthcare is uh, increasing ex exponentially, and more specifically in 2020, because of the available digital data uh, due to the pandemic, made it even, um, a very uh, growing field. And if you compare the publications in radiomics, you can see oncology is uh, the main, the main uh, field that uh, radiomic studies are published in. And you can see the main uh, uh, oncological papers are on brain uh, images and uh, breast uh, and GI, blast, blast lung. So how radiomics are used generally in, in, in oncology, they are mainly, it is mainly used for classification tasks to classify benign from malignant, and even for malignant to classify them according to stages, and then to predict the clinical outcome based on treatment received. So uh, why it is attractive? This is another question that usually oncologists raised and radiologists raised actually. Why it is attractive? We are doing great, and it's already there. Patients are receiving the treatment and they are improving. But actually, it is very attractive because there are lots of publications that shows from a CT scan and from the tumor itself, you can predict the biology of the disease of the tumor. You can even know the genomic signature of patients. So it goes from helping to identify the biomarker without taking any biopsy. It can tell you the pathological type, the stage of the disease, the diagnosis, uh, any treatment evolution, treatment response, and prognosis of patients. Is this theory? Is this, is this a dream? No, actually, research are there, and even there are some um, algorithms have been approved by FDA. So uh, the, the, the thing that I really like about radiomics, it is called virtual biopsy. Because nowadays, if a patient has a, a tumor uh, or a lump, uh, the first step is to be done is to take a biopsy from the a sample from that tumor and send it for pathological uh, identification. And this is an invasive procedure, and usually it takes uh, a sample from one area of the tumor, as you can see here from a thyroid. But for radiology, you can have a temporal and a spatial dimension from the tumor itself, which can be reflective of what is going on across the whole boundary of the tumor instead of one spot from the real tissue biopsy. So it's a virtual biopsy. The, 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 the benefits of it, it is non-invasive, and it can analyze the whole tumor, and it can be done several times without hurting the patient. 
So what are the recent uh, studies in radiomics uh, in oncology? There are so many actually. Uh, and even every day there are multiple of radiomics studies in oncology are showing there. I will just highlight some of them very fast, either to link them with pathological grade, with uh, tumor grade, with uh, la, the, the molecular markers uh, to uh, reflect on the heterogeneity of the diseases. There are uh, analysis uh, on uh, how to uh, if radiomics can predict the response to chemotherapy. There is uh, um, um, studies on identifying the phenotype and genotype of the tumor, studies on CTs, MRIs, PET scans. Uh, it was started on CT scans first, but now it extends to other modalities of radiology. But after, uh, despite all of this uh, research and publications in radiomics and oncology, is there any of these algorithms that reach FDA approval? Actually, yes, not too many, actually. They are very minimal, and there are lots of reasons which I will mention later. So um, one of the most recent uh, uh, FDA approved, <coughs> sorry, uh, one of the most recent FDA approved radiological algorithms are the uh, one that uh, uh, a software uh, that helps for early uh, detection of lung cancer, and it is mainly on CT scan, and the other one is on the diagnosis of prostate cancer. There are uh, a lot of approved, uh, FDA approved radiomic algorithms, but non-oncological, for example, one for stroke, and it's already in clinical use, but these are the most recent for oncology uh, diagnosis. So uh, in order to see why there are not much uh, of uh, approval for radiomics uh, algorithms, we need to know what is the pipeline for any radiomics study. So uh, let's go through it, and from there we can identify where are the gaps that prevent such uh, algorithms despite the very uh, ambitious and the very um, very uh, excited, uh, uh, exciting uh, results, still they are not uh, reaching the clinic. So if you see the, the pipeline, you, uh, we can see that first of all you should decide which radiological imaging or modality you will be uh, testing. CT scan, MRI, um, ultrasound, or PET scan or whatever, and then you start to uh, take the data from there uh, to identify which tumor, which uh, modality, and then you go through the step of segmentation, where you will identify the region of interest that you need from that particular image, and then you uh, ask a radiologist, and it should be an expert radiologist, to identify the area that need to be segmented, and then you feed it into uh, a system where there will be a lot of feature selection. I will go through each of step in details in a while. Uh, so you will choose which features you need to study, and uh, which features will be selected for analysis, and then you go through analysis. And if you go the, through the pipeline, actually it needs multiple specialties. It is not a work of a doctor, it's not a work of an AI expert, it's a collection of people and multidisciplinary research where here an, uh, um, a radiologist is needed, here an oncologist actually will be needed, here a data scientist and AI expert will be needed. So it's, it's a multidisciplinary research, and from the beginning you need to identify who will work with you instead of, uh, so you will not stop at the, at the middle of the project without having any progress. So uh, for image segmentation, currently actually the, most, the mostly used way of segmentation is either manual, where a radiologist will come and go through every single image and try to uh, demarcate or segment the region of interest, which is very costly, uh, not uh, very laborious, and it takes a lot of time, especially with the burden of lots of cancer diagnosis and lots of work and lots of CT scan done for a single patient. Uh, the other uh, mode of segmentation is the semi-automated uh, semi segmentation, which is already there, where there is a, help, a computer help with the radiologist involvement, and there is the fully automation, which is thriving nowadays, and there are lots of open sources, open source algorithms and softwares that can help with this. I haven't tried themselves, but uh, ourselves, but we are using for our current project. We are using uh, manual with semi automation. We haven't used the automated, the fully automated ones. Uh, then there will be the processing of the data after uh, the region of interest has been chosen. There will be a, a processing of the uh, region to uh, transform it from this original uh, shape to this cube-like uh, or voxel, uh, voxel uh, shape in order to reach this stage where all the data now, it can be 
colored or uh, like there is a color scale, either a gray scale or different colors, colors and numbers. And this will be readable by algorithms. The previous shape is not readable, so this one is readable. And this can be fed into whatever algorithm is built by the data scientist and the AI expert. And now at this stage, you need to choose which feature you will use for your study in order to uh, find the prediction or the diagnosis. And here is very critical step because some people, they are, you, for example, you get 10, 10 cases or 10, the sample size is 10, but you are checking 15 features. So now the number of features is more than the number of the sample size. And this will lead to something called overfitting. So you will find a pattern that's not really reflecting the reality. So the system is trying to find patterns in between data that's not, uh, that's not real. So if you see the features, we have qualitative, which are semantic features. And these usually are uh, reported by a radiologist. So this is not a new thing where a radiologist uh, usually uh, comment on the shape of the tumor, location, vascularity, speculation, and necrosis, and heterogeneity. So these are already existing data from any radiological report. The new thing is the quantitative, which are the agnostic features. And these are the mathematically extracted features, and there are so many, actually. They are first order statistics, uh, statistical features, second order statistical features, higher order statistical features, I will not go through them, but actually, from the beginning of any research, you need to decide which feature you need to check. Otherwise, you will end up having so many features that will give you what is called overfitting models, uh, where it will give you um, a conclusion that does not really exist, but the system is trying to find a pattern among all the features that you have chosen. So after having the feature selected, it will go through analysis and linking it with whatever other clinical data you have about the patient either the gene expression and clinical data, and this will give you a comprehensive information about the patient regarding what is in his radiological imaging, what is in his clinical chart, and what is his, in his clin uh, genomic studies. Uh, so uh, this is what is currently available in hospitals where the image will be done. The, patient, the, the radiologist will look at it. He will link it with whatever patient's clinical information, and there will be, it will be uh, saved in the local facts, and that's it. But what, what is envisioned, actually, is this, where the same pipeline will continue, but at the same time, as the doctor is seeing the radiological image, there will be an automatic segmentation. There are features that will be extracted. There are, uh, um, uh, uh, like, co correlated with whatever genomic and medical data available. The, it will be fed into a database, and that database uh, will be fed into an algorithm that will do the mining and decision support, and that will give a final or a decision support to the uh, radiologist, and that will help the radiologist to have a very comprehensive uh, data and picture about the patient in writing his report. So it is very fascinating. It looks very nice, and it's going very well. But why it is not, there is no much of uh, radiomics-based algorithms approved by FDA for clinical use. There are lots of limitations, actually, that hinder such acceptance. One of them is that there is a gap between the knowledge and the clinical needs, where the researcher will go through a research without having a very uh, significant need in the, in, the, in the clinic. For example, they want to see if a lung cancer is, uh, um, for example, related to uh, a geographical uh, uh, distribution of patients. Is he from America? Is he from Oman, for example? which is not very much needed by the oncologist to determine. So there are more uh, needed questions and there are more critical questions that need to be asked, which might help for such algorithm and such huge work to be translated into the clinic. Second one is reprodu reproducibility. And that's mainly because different machines and different softwares are used in different institutes. Even in the same institute sometimes, different radiological departments are using different machines, and that prevent or, or hinder such reproducibility of, of uh, radiomic studies. Lack of standardization, and this already, there is a lot of work on this where there are lots of international agencies. They are building standardized scores and standardized guidelines in order to uh, make the, the radiomic studies more standardized and quality, and the quality score is high. Insufficient reporting, because again, lack of expertise, the radiologists are busy with their routine clinical work and they cannot spare a lot of time in radiomic studies because it needs a lot of work from their side. 
lack of proper validation. Usually, uh, for a proper validation, you need to use a data set that was not involved in the original training set. And the best way is to do it from a different institute even, to have very unique data to be, to be tested, uh, for the algorithm to be tested. And this is not there yet because of lack of data and uh, data availability. Lack of comparison with well-established prognostic and predictive factors because currently the main prognostic and predictive factor is what the doctor and the oncologist see in their images. And this is not standard all, all over the place. Even RESIST is not uh, standard uh, uh, across the, the, the globe. Everyone is using his own uh, uh, based on their expertise. Retrospectively data collection, majority of radiomic studies are retrospective and we know all the drawbacks of retrospective studies. So a prospective study needs to be done for radiomic uh, studies, which is again a lot of uh, burden and lots of work. And all of these barriers uh, actually hinder such uh, improvement in radiomics approval. And here uh, this table is very uh, uh, like uh, comprehensive where it shows for every single uh, modality of radiomics or for radiology, there are lots of gaps and uh, drawbacks that uh, needs to be uh, taken care of uh, at the beginning of whatever research in radiomics. And as I told you, there are lots of agencies are building guidelines and uh, standard standardization for radiomics study which need to be taken care of uh, by the team, the research team from the beginning of the study. And I like this slide where it shows before, before even, once you have an idea about uh, for, to, to pursue uh, for uh, radiomic research, you need to ask yourself these questions. And the more yes you get out of these questions, the better the outcome that will come out of your study. So let's, let's have a look at some of them. For example, is there an actual clinical need which could potentially be answered by your research? Uh, is there enough expertise in the research team? Because otherwise you will, you will, you will be stuck in, in, in the middle. Is there access to enough data? If you have very, very small data, that will be only for uh, the training. What about the testing? Where you will do your testing? And there is, there is a formula where they say 60 to 40 or uh, 70 to 30. If you use 70% of your data for training, the remaining 30 needs to be for testing. Otherwise, you will, you will lose the validity of your program, of your uh, uh, algorithm. Uh, is it possible to retrieve all other non-imaging data, for example, uh, clinical data, genomic data, pathological data to link it with radiomics? Is the information, is information on the acquisition and reconstruction of the images available? Um, are the imaging protocols standardized or not in your institute? Otherwise, it will be uh, a noise, a lot of noise included in the study from the beginning. Uh, so these are one of the guidelines. I didn't, uh, it is very strong, uh, like very long one, uh, but it is there in, in, in the website. And this is how we envision the radiomics where a patient will be received. He will go, uh, uh, he will undergo some clinical uh, and uh, radiological imaging and the imaging will be available. The data will, uh, the, the data output will go through the uh, image segmentation, hopefully automated, fully automated. And then there will be lots of radiomics features extracted it will go through analysis and that will give a decision for therapy and prognosis of patients. That will make, hopefully, life easier for radiologists and oncologists. Uh, that's it from my side and uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to do so. Thank you, Dr. Adari, uh, for this great talk. Uh, I'm excited, I'm sure uh, Dr. Leila also excited for such topic. Well, I heard uh, you have already some radiomic based Yeah, we research started the, the going on in Kuwait. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We started the core, uh, I mean, for uh, radiomics library. So it's in oncology? It's uh, oncology and hypoxia and cardiotoxicity. Very good. So Very good. Uh, we're trying then to. Then we can extend the collaboration then. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Very I'm good. sure Dr. Layla have a uh, question. Sure, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Adari, for this uh, brilliant talk. Thank you. You really summarize the challenges in Radiomix. Um, I totally agree with you when you talked about uh, standardization, because um, even with a, a, a simple experience uh, that uh, I have with uh, predicting values, for example, for uh, uptake, as I mentioned to Dr. Mohri yesterday, um, we uh, try to uh, feed the data or train the data with something related to a certain procedure in one hospital. Mm -hmm. 
and it worked very well, and life was so easy, and we were so happy that we are reaching to the top of the mountain. But we realized that let us try using other data from other hospital. Then we realized that everything is corrupted, and uh, we were not near any uh, um, success um, uh, values for uh, uh, correlation. Then uh, we investigated, and it was the procedure done uh, in getting those data in other hospital is different, different. than the other. Exactly. So again, this is one factor which is very important. Another one is um, how much of your uh, pathological uh, data uh, and uh, retrieving these, uh, um, as you mentioned, um, will uh, really help in um, getting closer to your uh, texture or the feature in the image. So I totally agree, it's, uh, the life is not easy. Uh, you need to try and uh, uh, never stop when you are uh, let down by, by uh, one methodology. Yeah, and uh, that's very good, uh, actually, what you raised. But from the beginning, for the research team, they need to, f to figure out, is the plan clear? Are we having the data that are needed? Are we having the needed expertise? Otherwise, there will be no outcome, and it will be a waste of time. So this needs to be, to be figured out at the beginning of, of any research. So whatever the outcome will come, it will be uh, very suitable, or it will be ready for translation into clinic. Otherwise, it will remain as research. Or maybe that research even will not be shown because of lack of, of, uh, of uh, continuation. It will not progress further. Yeah. And uh, from many literature survey, I mean, uh, I figured out most of the radiomics studies and most of the predictive variables, uh, variables used uh, are not necessary. Yes. So as you the said, features, this is, you yeah, yeah, the features are not necessary mm -hmm. uh, have like a clinical translation application. Exactly. So that's the problem. The effort is, I mean, sometimes this it takes. Yeah, yeah, sorry, but this was, it was the first question to be asked. Is ha does it have any clinical utility? Otherwise, there is no way. Thank you for Thank raising you so this point. Uh, Thank you. Don't, don't forget the halwa, please. Do you want us to pass it through? <laughs> we will pass it through. Yeah, sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Is there another question? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, actually it's a comment. It's a wonderful talk. Just I want to share the experience which we have. So always we don't need to look, especially when there is less data set, mm -hmm. like 40, 90, 80, or something like that. We can go with 99, 1, meaning mm -hmm. We use one case as training, mm -hmm. and we keep these changing every time. Okay. In that way, you get a lot of uh, 99 into 1, yeah. and uh, we take average of the model. This is a cross-validation. Cross, yes, 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 yes. So that's uh, a yeah. very uh, like, uh, good thing, especially when we have less, less data. Yeah, that's a very good point. When you don't have much of data, exactly. you can do cross-validation where for the first trial, case number one will one. be the training, yes. the other 99 will be for validation. Yeah, and yeah. then you move to case number two, which will be the training, and then the other ones will be the for validation. No, actually, testing. Testing, testing, yeah. testing, testing, testing and yes, training. Yes, yes, yeah. the rest yeah. of the thing. Very yeah. nice comment. Mm. Yes. Thank you. I have uh, yeah, one. Sure. I mean, if there is no question. Any question, Any question, from, question from, from the audience? There is a question there. Excuse me, if it's too early to use it, uh, to use radiomics in uh, pr um, diagnosis or prognosis in uh, oncology, is there any chances or has it been tested for uh, screening yet? Screening, you mean for Pre cancer? Yeah. Actually, uh, for uh, nowadays, the screening of majority of cancer is not through radiology. Uh, except lung cancer. Lung cancer, there is the CT scan, which is the, the modality of uh, the best modality for screening of lung cancer, and it's already there. It has been approved recently, 2021, mm -hmm. to be used for screening. So radiomics is already there for screening of lung cancer. But if you consider other types of cancer that has a screening program, for example, colorectal cancer, it's colonoscopy. And uh, breast cancer, it is mammogram. Mammogram is already there. There are lots of work on uh, translation of mammograms into, uh, use of radiomics into mammogram screening. 
but not yet reach the FDA approval. Again, because mammograms, majority of them, they are, uh, they are done by um, non-standardized machines all over the world, and majority of studies are done abroad, so that it can't be generalized. That's the main thing that, that hinders No comparison such studies. You, Sorry? Are there any comparison studies? There are lots of studies in mammograms. Yeah, yeah, lots of studies. In fact, it's the majority. One of the majority uh, of radiomic studies for, uh, for screening is in mammogram for breast cancer. But uh, till now, it did not reach the, the FDA program. Thank you. So with research, more research, every research will, 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 uh, will correct what has happened earlier, and that will, will facilitate the acceptance and the approval. Yes, thank you. I have uh -huh. one last question. I mean, uh, yeah, as a comment for the cancer, there are no, no clinica clinically validated radiomics up to now. Maybe you are familiar with mm -hmm. this. But there are like many st uh, for lung cancer, but there are many topics uh, related to non-small, uh, sorry, yeah, small uh, cell, cell lung cell. carcinoma yeah, uh, for uh, and uh, related hypoxia conditions. Mm -hmm using new radio tracers, but they are not uh, still not FDA approved. One last question about, um, I mean, I face problem with validation of my segmentation technique. Mm -hmm. Always the segmentation is uh, the biggest enemy in radiology. Yeah, so. Are you doing it manual? No, I'm, I'm trying to, to use the AI, okay. and using the AI requ requires using fully automated segmentation mm -hmm. techniques. Mm -hmm. So what is the best approach to, I mean, to take if I want to use automated? Is it visual uh, confirmation or with a multidisciplinary team or? Well, well for our project. Is there project, any AI technique yeah, that I could? For our project, we use manual and semi-automated. Because the, the, auto, the fully automated ones, I believe they are not ready yet. The boss is here, actually. He's, he's, he's doing the segmentation for us in our project. So um, uh, the automated needs needs more more need to be more uh, more research is needed on them to prove how effic efficient they are, but uh, the gold standard one is to be done by a radiologist. That that will give you a peace of mind and you can proceed. But again, availability of radiologists is the issue. And, and even open open source is there already. And there are open source. Yeah, how how effective and accurate they are? That's the question. Yeah, the gold standard is... Yeah, you start standard. from manual, then you move to the... To compare, to yeah. compare. Yes. I have you. something to yeah. add here. Yes. For radiomics approval by FDA, during COVID, they had a new thing which is called emergency approval of, of radiomics. And they approved lots of uh, algorithm, al radiomics algorithm to read the um, um, x-rays of patients with COVID to facilitate the diagnosis. So they got, so they got a approval despite you know, there are no many data on them. So had the current uh, people who were working on mammogram and there are thousands of research on it, and people who are working on uh, uh, X-ray for COVID, they got the approval mammogram, they didn't. So it wasn't fair, but because of the emergency approval, due to the pandemic, it was, it was there already. So they sacrificed all these guidelines and they just ignored them, just for emergency approval. Yes, thank okay. you, Doctor. Thank you so much. Next session will be with uh, Mr. Ali Nairat uh, from our bronze sponsor, uh, Central Circle. Uh, we will be talking about uh, AI potential and stepping the future of uh, the healthcare. Thank you. Please welcome Mr. Ali.
Good afternoon. I hope that's. Yep. Good. Okay. Good. Just one sec. All right. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. And it's really a privilege to be here in a hall um, full of talented people. And um, those talented people are eager to learn, and this is exactly what we need. And hopefully in the future that you will make an impact, you'll create the impact. Because it's all about creating an impact nowadays, and especially in healthcare, where we found ourselves, especially after the pandemic, that we not lacking behind, but there's still many more to do. And that's exactly what we are trying to build a new generation are eager, um, have the right inspiration and also the right tools. So it's not an easy mission, it's a tough one. And therefore, so we are trying to do the same in, um, in Philips Healthcare. <coughs> so when we started the company, it's more than 130 years ago and it started with a light bulb. It's a very simple thing. And then they started to expand into the technology, many technology things, not only healthcare, went into the TVs, CDs, and then expanded into the radiology, the X-ray, it started with the fluoroscopy. <coughs> and when you look at the healthcare, it's really a challenging field where you need really all the hands on deck just to create an impact. Again, we are looking for an impact. So we focused, we narrow it and spend off a lot of businesses to focus more on the healthcare only. And the healthcare is not only when patients go into the hospital, but it also goes along all what we call in Philips is the health continuum. So it's from the healthy living, the lifestyle, all the way to get the right treatment and the follow up. So this was the portfolio. This is the portfolio that we are working on and this is where we need to um, come up with a new innovations just to create and solve unsolved the problem nowadays. So we need to touch base on things that no one has touched yet. And we need to solve, most importantly, problems that are really common where they might impact the people that we love, our families, our kids, and also ourselves. So if you look at the statistics nowadays, it's really staggering. So they are saying one out of three people will have a cancer. And those statistics, statistics, maybe it's not correct, but it's too close to be correct. So if you look at the challenges in the healthcare nowadays, so you will have the number of patients are really increasing. And <coughs> increasing in a way that really the hospital are not capable to have this so many patients. And that's what we witnessed in the pandemic. So we have the care few because we need to plateau the curve. And everyone was asking, what does it mean? That mean the hospitals globally does not capable to accept a huge number of patients at the same time because we don't have enough resources. And when you look at the World Health Organization report, they are saying that by 2035, there's an expectation of deficit in the healthcare workers and skills by 12.9 million. And this is something really increased the burden on the hospital CEOs, the government as well. So they are in the situation where the number of patients are increasing, but also the workforces are decreasing. So there is no enough doctors or nurse to patient ratio. But at the same time, they are looking to invent a way, come up with a new strategy that they need to do more with whatever resources they have. So that's why nowadays if you go to the hospitals, you talk to the doctors, to the nurses, you feel the burnout, but also they feel the obligation that they cannot walk away. But at a certain point, Hospital CEOs, head of departments, and also the government, they are witnessing and recognizing that they need to come up with a new solutions, a new business model 
where they can just ease the burden from the healthcare providers and give it to the technology. So, in the past decade, we witnessed a lot of digitization, that's everything shifted from uh, conventional into digital. And now you have a lot of um, medical electronic records, your images, even smart watches that measure your um, heart rate, um, ECG, and all of these are too much data. <clears throat> Not to mention if you will go to the radiology in the imaging, you will find that the CT scan nowadays it can give you in one rotation 256 slides where the doctor need to go through them. But in the past, it was like really less than half of them. So all of this overwhelming the doctors and the nurses that they need to go through a lot of information just to give the proper diagnosis. So digitization can be the solution, but also it's overwhelm the workers that they need to go through a lot of things to um, to come to a decision at the end of the day. So in Philips, we, we wanted to create something to help just to switching from being, just solving the problem after it's happened to be more predictive. And we use the strategy that we need to use the data because we have the data everywhere. It's not we, but every hospital, they have the data. And also we need to combine it with the technology, the AI, Internet of Things, plus the human knowledge, the experience, because this is the base of everything. So with those three combinations, we can go into more personalized, more targeted, more proactive, more predictive healthcare. And this is where we think that it will create a huge impact. <clears throat> so we are not there in everything yet, but we can see a lot of bright spots. So here and there, some algorithms. And we're gonna talk about those algorithms that exist right away, but also we need to focus on the vision. <coughs> Before the vision, so this is slides, I talked a lot about it, but <coughs> one of the things that we committed to, so we deal in our innovation in the company, um, that's we come, up, we come up with idea, but then how we decide that we will make the solution yes or no. So the committee that they said, we have two filters. The first filter is any solution that we will come up with should be fit in this health continuum from healthy living to the diagnostic. We don't want to be distracted because at the end of the day, partnership is always there. So we need to partner with others and we need to be focused from healthy living to home care. The second filter, it has to pass something called the quadruple aim. So we all know it's the, big, it's, it's, it's the big elephant in the room. That's no one would like to talk about it. It's kind of a taboo, but it's there. The budget constraint. Like the technology is really nice, but it's expensive in the beginning. And if you need to make the technology at the top where it can help to create everything, it's really difficult to swallow it at once. So you need to go step by step. <clears throat> and that's where some of the yesterday examples about the learning that we need to come up with expertise. So we need to be set correctly to start learn the people, not to start teaching the people without having the right setup because you need to have the tools, the data accessibility. Everything is ready for you. The, um, the, the languages that you want to, to use, the, the, the algorithms that you want to use. So if it's past those two filters, and then our solution is released to the market. It's very simple. So therefore, there is a concept, and we are not the only one are working towards it. So it's something called digital twin. <clears throat> and I'm sure that some of you hear about it. <clears throat> so maybe you heard about the metaverse, but this is something, um, let me state it this way, not to, to make myself politically correct it's more realistic than the metaverse, yeah? So the idea that I need to create a digital copy of myself to be ready at the point of care. If I go to any doctor anywhere in the world, they have access to my data and they can see everything about me. Everything, my daily activities, my watch records, my um, 
uh, clinical file records in anywhere in the hospital. If I had radiology, if I had diabetes, if I had a cancer, if I had the whole history. <clears throat> and then the idea of this, it has like really, um, the limit is the sky. What's the kind of benefits that you have? Even <coughs> some ideas that if you need to make an operation so you can calculate what kind of risks, failure, and success out of this operation before you do it. So this is exactly the digital twin, or the optimum digital twin that we want to reach today. Is it there? Not yet. But the staggering result that the research on the digital twin um, had been conducted by a company called Garner, it's a famous company doing the research on the, on the healthcare, and the research was in 2018. <coughs> and the result of the research, hear carefully. The digital twin is not exist, and it will not be exist for the next 30 years, three zero. After 30 years, so 2018, 30 years, we are talking about 2038, uh, 48 or 50. After 30 years, digital twin will not be 100% personalized. What does it mean? Let me give you an example. <coughs> if, you, if you know someone has diabetes, or you do, and then there are some AI application for the, for the diabetes, and those AI application for the diabetes, they are giving you kind of prediction what kind of risk that you are going into. So the problem with diabetes patient that they are really struggling to plan their day ahead. They are afraid if they will go for the beach in the middle of the event, they will have the fever. So this is their problem. So they need some kind of calculation, prediction. Today you will be okay, you can plan some, some business. The problem with those application, they are not per personalized for you. They are personalized for, they call it like cohort, group of people, <coughs> age, uh, based on ethnic, or based on geography. So I'll say Middle East, it's a Middle East, or GCC, it's a GCC. But it's not personalized for you. So they were saying the digital twin, even after 30 years, it will not be personalized. It will also contain some of the cohort um, data. Why? Because they were knowing that the accessibility of the data is something really difficult. Why? Because of the privacy, the regulatory. And then, long story short, after the pandemic, <laughs> the expectation went from 30 years to 10 to 15 years. And this is the positive side of the pandemic. Unfortunately, the pandemic taught us the hard way that we lost a lot of people that we love. We had a lot of unfun time, unprecedented time, but also on the positive side, it shortened the period where I wanted to be in the healthcare because it was like a wake up call. That's hey, you guys are behind. You can do a lot, you have the technology, you have the expertise, all what you need to do is just to work together. So, <coughs> now, as a bottom line, digital twin does not exist, expected in the next 10 years to 15 years to be exist, to be more personalized, because now we see a lot of data that you can generate by yourself, wearable devices like watches and the, the, the peacemaker, all of these devices can be connected and all, all of what you need is just to liquidate the data to those machine learning so they can calculate and predict. So, this is the future, what about what exists right now? So there are a lot of um, things that already exist um, within our portfolio. <coughs> I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I will highlight some of them. So very quick, I will take you into the radiology department, the imaging, because it's the easiest one and there's a lot of um, um, examples about the imaging because the imaging that you will have the data available, you can integrate it with the workflow and also standardization of the image. As Dr. Adari said, the standardization is something important that you can create AI algorithm. One of the things that we added from our side, it's just like the cherry on top of the cake. So if you have an AI, it's really cool. So let's think about it like this. If I will say, guys, who likes Ferrari cars by raising your hand, just without saying anything. Now, unbelievable just to, come on. Ferrari, it's a Ferrari, like 1,000 horsepower 
just walking, whatever. And if I would tell you that's, would you like to have a Ferrari? Absolutely, of course, who doesn't, right? But the problem, sorry? Porsche, fine, I, I'm gonna give you three, don't worry. So the, the idea that yes, we need the Ferrari, but what we took for granted, all of us, we take something for granted, is what? Pain. Pain? No, it's the loan. the loan. No, no, but let's say that it's a free of charge. But we took something really for granted, guys. It's the streets, the infrastructure, right? What about giving you a Ferrari in the middle of the desert? Doesn't make sense. So we take something for granted as exists is the street. And the same for AI. It's nice to have the AI, it's gonna solve the problem. Make sure it's fit with the workflow that you have. If you have a workflow in radiology, don't create a technology to interrupt this workflow. No, make it adapt to the context. They say the best technology is a technology which is invisible, that you don't think about it. So that's what we did <coughs> in the radiology. So in the radiology, you have the workflow, that's you have the modality packs. They are telling me I have three minutes, so I'm gonna be quick. You have the modality, the packs, and then the image goes from the modality packs and then in the viewer, and then the doctor will come and open and start reading, right? <coughs> so what we did, we built something in the back. No one knows about it. No human interfered. It's called the AI engine, where the image will go through this AI engine and give you the result next to the packs. The result is with the heat map, where the abnormalities, and then because of the regulatory, we will ask the doctor, do you accept this result, yes or no? If you accept the result, yes, and then the image is stored in the packs. It's nice, very nice, very quick. Is it impactful? Maybe not too much, but it's nice. I didn't feel it. So it's within the context. So this is one of the advices, and we keep pushing, that if you need to do something, you have to do it within the context. One of the more things that we added, also if you look, it's not clear here, but if you look at the work list of the doctors, if they have like 1,000 patients a day, or 150 or whatever, they don't have the time to read all of it, because we say all of them are under really burnout, so they need something to ease on them. So the, the algorithm will prioritize any abnormalities cases on the top. So the doctor will say, yeah, the, the AI will say, hey doctor, you have like 100 cases, 30 of them, we expect abnormalities, please review them the first, and then go along the rest of the cases. So this was for the radiology. And also we have another <coughs> solution, it's for the, um, for the general ward and the ICU patient. So on a quick, very quick on, on demand. So we found that there is 17% of the patient after the operation, they got deterioration. That's they got an, an, an a reverse event. And we don't know this reverse event, it could be sepsis or cardiac arrest or pulmonary um, uh, problem. So <coughs> this solution, in a simple word, it's keep calculating your vital signs and then it can give you kind of an early warning score. That's if the vital signs will show that this patient might be deteriorating, it will give you warning, notification, and then you can intervene not to transfer the patient to the ICU quickly, so you can intervene while he's in the general ward and reduce a lot of cost, reduce the mortality rate, reduce the disease adverse, the adverse events, all of them, you name it. So, this is it. Uh, those are the takeaways, the concluding remarks. I know that there's a lot to talk. Maybe you have a lot of questions. I don't know if I can take some of them, but if I didn't, I just need you to remember three things. That there is a huge opportunity in the healthcare domain for the AI. And by the way, if you didn't start yet, you are not late. So you're still in the beginning. You can catch up and you can define your pain and build it. The second thing that there are many solutions already exist, so don't start from the scratch, build on top, because every innovation is like this. You copy, paste, innovate, and there is no shy on it. So you take the existing technology, you build on top of it, and then you go ahead. And just for your information, 
all the algorithms on radiology imaging is built on a Facebook technology. So they are not building their own algorithm, right? So they, they use the Facebook technology. The third thing that <coughs> AI principle are essential to acceptance, adaptation, don't resist. So we face a lot of resistance and we push too hard. Government, universities, hospitals, doctors that no technology will help you, just use it. Don't worry, you will enhance, it will take some of the work. So those are the three takeaways. And I'm looking forward to meet you at 2 p.m. <coughs> we have like kind of an open discussion, a lot of questions that we will hopefully address those objectives together. If you have any questions, just join us. I still don't know where's the place exactly, but I'm looking forward to meet you guys and have an open dialogue. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. I think I have uh, time for uh, two questions. Sure. Any questions? Uh. So, um, when you talked about uh, integrating AI technology, um, it has to go with the workflow. So, could you highlight how would you evaluate uh, or verify or validate nice. the integration. <laughs> it's really yeah, difficult. <laughs> no, that, that's great. So, um, uh, so from an experience, that's what we what we what we usually recommend for the researchers and the data scientists. That hey guys, you build your algorithms, you build the architect, and at the end of the day, try to make it in the um, they call it Dockerization. Like they're using the Docker coating. It's the Google technology. And whenever you have this algorithm into this Docker coating, you can integrate it in any PAC system. How you will validate? I would recommend that you validate on production environment. That's mean clinical PACs environment. Because you need the data to be fed in the algorithm, and you need to compare the result. So, um, and also I recommend for the researchers that to segregate between the research environment and the production environment. So you do the validation there, and if you need to enhance to improve the scoring, you go back to the um, research environment. So if you need to validate, you have to have the agreement with the production environment, like one of the hospitals, to give you the access. Also, um, building the routes, like routing the images, is not something difficult. What we are facing difficulties with is the permission. Especially if, you, if you're working with the government, yeah, it's going to be tough. But we can do it. So we have done it in KSA, for example. We um, connected all the MOH hospitals into Research Hub. And in, the, in between, there was like an anonymization uh, engine. So you will not see the patient data, but you will be fitted with the data. And then when you validate, also the same data, you can just connect it to this Docker and you will see the result on the other side. So you don't have to switch. <coughs> but when we said, even when you have the permission, you will face difficulties because it's kind of a sensitive topic. I don't know why actually, but like if it's within the country, one country, I really don't know why the people are resisting. If it's across borders, I can understand. But the, technically there is no real challenge, but you need the, governance around it, the approvals. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully understand, but also we need to push, and that's what we are trying to do, actually, we and the universities. We are trying to push hard the government that they need to ease the, the privacy, because it doesn't make sense. The same for FDA. So you gave me permission on COVID, so you have to make it the same. Otherwise, I recommend countries like UAE, KSA, where, where I have connections, I will tell them, guys, don't wait for the FDA. You, you, you have to create your own committee. So you approve for the country. And if someone will take it outside of the country, it's their call, right? Yes, thank you. And one tricky approach is to invest in education. Sure thing. Yeah. Uh, funding is, is, is number one. So, but funding alone does not work. A human knowledge or expertise alone does not work. And uh, infrastructure alone does not work. So that's why we are recognizing as, as a health tech company that now we are partnering with universities, hospital, government, 
because one of the things that the standardization, that's why I don't have the, the data liquidate across the country. Why, why, it's, it's why you guys, you, you don't move. And then I, I recognize it's too much expensive. So yes, we can swallow it one by one, but we have to come together to, to make the impact, which what we need. Thank you. Is there any other question? Thank you. I think the solution is always uh, with what you stated, the personalized approach and proactive right. approach. Uh, thank you for your great talk. Uh, now I welcome uh, our colleague, Dr. Uh, Suleiman Mazidi. Uh, Dr. Suleiman Mazidi, he is a reputable professional in the field of uh, surgery. He have uh, many publication in this uh, corresponding field. Uh, yeah, we had to push the, the s schedule ahead because he have like, a, a, you know, busy sch schedule, yeah? Yeah, please welcome Dr. Suleiman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the organizer, first of all, for inviting me to this uh, amazing conference. Uh, and I'd like to w welcome everyone uh, to uh, this talk. It's going to be a short talk. I know everybody's hungry and there's uh, lunch on the way. So I'm going to talk uh, briefly about the, our experience in robotic surgery in Kuwait. I know there was a talk yesterday by uh, Dr. Uh, Saad Dosiri. For those of you who were here yesterday, he spoke about the early experiences of robotic surgery uh, in Kuwait. Uh, he remains the pioneer of robotic surgery, so he was the first to start it in Kuwait. Uh, in Jabal Hospital, we started in 2019. So that's when we first started using the surgical robot. As uh, you all know, Jabal Hospital is a very new hospital. Uh, I'm the chief of surgery there. It's, it was the biggest hospital in Kuwait until 2020 when Jahra Hospital opened. Jahra Hospital, the new one, has uh, I think 30 more beds, so it's a bit bigger. Uh, but Jabar has 1,240 beds. Uh, it opened in uh, November 2018, so now it's uh, five, five, uh, four years anniversary. Uh, it has its area of 720,000 square meters, 5,000 car parks, just to give you an idea of how big it is. It's a massive, massive hospital. And as you can see, I don't know which one is the laser pointer. Yeah. So as, as you can see, there's the main building, and then there's a separate trauma center. So a, a center that's dedicated only for trauma. It's like a standalone hospital. And since we started, uh, in Jabir, we always uh, try to maintain excellence in patient care. We didn't want to be just another uh, hospital in Kuwait. Uh, in 2020, we were uh, lucky enough to obtain a center of excellence accreditation. So we were the first, and we remain the only government hospital in Kuwait today with accreditation as a center of excellence from uh, the Surgical Review Corporation, which is a United States-based corporation. And it's something we're very proud of. It means basically the standard of care you get as a bariatric patient in Jabir is just as good as any other internationally acclaimed center in the US or the UK. Before we talk about robotics, we have to talk about the past. We have to see how the surgical field reached where we have reached today. So I'd like to start off with a very uh, quick story. Uh, this was almost a thousand years ago. There was a king uh, in Spain called Sancho. They used to call him Sancho the Fat. Uh, other kings used to be called the conquerors and the, uh, the great fighters, but he was called the Fat because he was so obese, he couldn't even ride his own horse. So when he, rose, when he rode the horse, the horse actually collapsed. So the people of Spain at the time, they got, uh, they got around and they told him, listen, we don't think you're fit enough to be king, and they put him in exile. So they removed him from his... Uh, from his position. Of course, he was sad, so he went and he, saw, he thought, I should find the best doctor in the world to help me lose the weight. The best medical people at the time, of course, were the, uh, the, the Muslims in Spain, in, uh, in Andalus. This was the best doctor at the time. His name was Hasde bin Shaprut. He's Jewish, but he was the personal doctor of Khalifa Abdurrahman III, Abdurrahman Thalith. He was his personal doctor, so he told him, please, can you help me lose weight? 
So he said yes, and he performed the first bariatric or weight loss surgery we know until today. He took some stitches, and he actually stitched his mouth shut. He left a small opening where he can fit a straw just to have some liquid, but he basically uh, restricted his caloric intake with the stitch, and over the course of the next year, he actually lost enough weight. In the year 960 AD, he came back and returned as the king of Spain. Leon is another name for Spain. So he returned uh, having this new uh, physique as the king. So this was the first bariatric surgery that we know of in history. The bad news is, uh, a year later, he went back and invaded uh, Andalus, and they got rid of uh, Khalifa Abdul Rahman al who helped him get treated. But that's, a, that's another political story that we're not going to talk about. So the present, where do we stand today? Uh, as most of you know, robotics, like artificial intelligence, is taking over the surgical world. Today in the United States, there is not a single hospital that does not have a robot. So every surgical department in the US has a robot. It's taking over the surgical world. How it first started was uh, basically an accident happened uh, in a Russian space station. This is the salute. It was a Russian space station, and uh, they had spent uh, millions and billions of rubles to send it uh, in space. What happened was one of the cosmonauts, the Russian cosmonauts, developed appendicitis while in space. So they had to cancel the program and lose all the, the rubles they spent to bring him back to Earth to have his appendix removed. So at that time, NASA and the US thought that they need to fix this somehow. And uh, there was a medical student at the time who was thinking of doing the robot. And they spoke to him. They hired him in NASA. And together, they created a robot, which they thought would help them treat astronauts in space while the surgeon is on Earth. This never happened because of the uh, delayed latency in time uh, and bandwidth of the, uh, of the networks at the time, but however, this started the idea of robotic surgery. You can see here, it's very clear, there is a rapid growth in robotic surgery. Uh, this is a publication that is from the year 2020. Uh, the blue line here is general surgery, which is uh, where I work in. And you can see there's a massive, a massive increase in the amount of cases being done uh, in the United States and globally in terms of general surgery. The first people who adapted the robot were the gynecologists and urologists. Because initially, the robot was used for the pelvis. And they, they were interested in operating on the pelvis. But you can see that the, the, its applicability in general surgery has surpassed them now. So it's being used more and more in general surgery. The main advantage of the robot uh, is it helps the surgeons uh, imitate or replicate the natural hand movement. Traditionally, when we do laparoscopy or laparoscopic surgery, it's uh, basically we have instruments that either open or close, uh, which is what you can see here on the left-hand side. So this is traditionally what we do. We put uh, four or five small holes, uh, one or five millimeter holes, and we use these instruments. These instruments don't articulate. They cannot turn right and left. They merely open and close. With the robot, you have a 520 degree range of motion. So you can see here, this is what the robot can do. You can do things that even a normal human, so if we had the case done with open surgery, even my own hands cannot do the things that the robot can do. The robot is even better than the actual human surgeon using her or his own hands today. So this is the main advantage of using a robot. In Jabbar Hospital, as I said, we started in 2019, late 2019, early 2020. Unfortunately, corona happened afterwards, and all of you know Jabbar Hospital shut down uh, during COVID. Uh, you can see here, when we first started, uh, we did 25 cases, and then we went down in 2021 to just nine cases. But so far in 2022, we restarted the program in uh, January. So this year, we have done uh, 49 cases, and this is, these statistics are a month old. We actually performed 20 cases just uh, this month. So in November, we performed 20 cases. It's being used more and more, and the, the surgeons and the patients are both seeing the advantages of the surgical robot. We do a wide range of surgeries. Uh, I know this is, this is a lot to comprehend, but basically, we're just trying to say that anything in surgery can be done robotically today. Uh, if not 
the same results, much better results for the patients, and definitely makes surgery a lot easier for the surgeons. A lot of times, uh, we've published a few papers about robotics. A lot of times, people always ask about patient outcomes. What's the outcome for the patient? Is the patient doing better? The patients, when you compare laparoscopy and robotics, perform equally in terms of outcomes. However, the main advantages are for the main variable that people don't usually see, which is the healthcare worker, the surgeon. There is a massive difference for the surgeon in terms of ergonomics, in terms of how many cases they can do a day when it comes to robotics. When I do a laparoscopic gastric bypass, for example, it takes maybe around four hours. But when I finish, I feel so physically drained that I can do no other case that day. That's it, I go home and sleep until the next day. But with the robot, because I'm sitting down, the movements are easier, there's less physical drain, I could do four or five cases without feeling any drain at all. So at the end of the day, there are clear advantages for the robot compared to even laparoscopy. Most of our patients are, uh, are female, and this goes in line with uh, most uh, general surgery cases. And uh, general surgery has been doing the most number of cases. This includes things like robotic cholecystectomies, robotic hernia repairs. We also have the colorectal program. We do, they do a lot of rectal uh, cancers using the robot. Uh, and then uh, bariatric surgeries like gastric bypasses uh, that use the robot as well. I'm not going to go into details, uh, but basically I put these slides up to show you that the complication rates using the, the robot in terms of general surgery, colorectal surgery, uh, and general surgery are very similar, if not equal to uh, laparoscopic surgery. Uh, what, uh, what we've noticed is throughout these three years, we've had no conversions to open, so we never had to open a patient up, convert them from laparoscopy, and we've had no reported mortalities within 30 days, and this is something very good. It's a very good uh, performance indicator when it comes to surgery. I'm just going to show you a quick video uh, just to show you what it's like. This is a, a case that I did. Just to show you how much robotics makes life easier. So this, I'm here connecting the small intestine to the stomach. Uh, I think the lights, I don't know if we can switch off the lights or dim them at least. So you can see here, uh, what I'm seeing is I'm, uh, I'm on a console, which is almost like a video game console, like an Oculus. So I see 3D. In traditional laparoscopy, the lens we have is 2D. So you cannot have depth perception. With the robot, there are two different lenses. There's a right lens and a left lens. So I have depth perception here as I'm operating. Uh, traditionally, in surgery, the surgeon has two hands, and then you have an assistant holding a camera and another assistant holding an instrument. With the robot, all of these can be done by a single person. So I control four arms as a surgeon. I don't need anybody to assist me with the robot. So again, this do, reduces the need for extra manpower. So here you can see the camera is being controlled by myself. And then I have three arms that I'm controlling, not two. I have an arm that is lifting up the stitch, and I have two arms that are doing the active movements. And then I can switch between these two arms. Uh, in traditional laparoscopy, this stitch would be almost impossible to take because it's called a forward stitch. So you have to stitch forwards, not sideways. But with the robot, with the articulation, this can easily be done, as you can see in this picture. So here we have the stomach above and the small intestine here, which we are connecting together in a gastric bypass. Uh, and one last thing is to show you, it's like you're, uh, it's almost like you're, you're on a fighter jet. So you have things that it's like a, a, a little bit of augmented reality. So you can see here the console, the camera, where it's pointing up or down, the degrees of motion. And it's like you're driving a plane. When the camera switches sideways, uh, it actually shows you that you're not in the horizon. And then it also tells you what instruments you have here and whether or not they have coagulation ability or not. There is another option as well that uh, is not in this video, but we can also add something called Firefly, which is also augmented reality. We inject a patient with a dye, and then we click a button, and we can see all the blood vessels. So we can tell if blood is reaching the anastomosis or not. 
If we do a gallbladder removal, we can see if there's an injury to the cystic ducts or not. Uh, and this makes life a lot easier, the use of augmented reality in these cases. So finally, um, of course, we were in the media recently uh, because we've completed 100 cases. This was uh, two months ago. And it's a, it's a milestone for, uh, for Kuwait and for the region. Uh, there's uh, only a few centers around the Gulf that have completed 100 general surgical cases, and we're proud to be one of them. Uh, and I'd, finally, I'd like to invite you all to a conference we are holding in 10 days. It's going to be Saturday, December 10th. It will be the first surgical robotics conference in the entire region, in the entire uh, Middle East, uh, North Africa region. And we invite all of you to attend. The website is uh, roboticskw.com. And uh, we're more than happy to welcome uh, any of you to the conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Salman. Um, we have time for a few questions, if you have time, doctor. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I do have yeah. time. Uh, any questions from the audience? Thank you, doctor, for your brilliant uh, talk. I enjoyed uh, listening to this uh, talk. Uh, I want to ask, uh, what's the percentage of error uh, for the robotics? Or how precise is it? So uh, th that's, a, that's a good question, actually. Um, there's no exact, in medicine, we don't calculate error as per se, error per se. There's different measures for error, however, uh, if you want to look, for example, uh, when it comes to hand stability as a measure of error, if we're doing laparoscopy or open cases, sometimes surgeons have uh, their hands shake, for example. With the robot, it actually calculates this and it cancels it out. So even if uh, uh, some doctors, they have benign tremors, if they use the robot, their hands are going to be really steady. So it actually reduces this error. However, if you're talking about patient outcome, and complication rate, it is uh, the robot is uh, in general surgery is equal to laparoscopy. So there's no increase in error when it comes to robotics over uh, conventional laparoscopy. But there are some specific cases where the robot is at an advantage. When it comes to the pelvis, any surgeries in the pelvis or in the foregut, if it's uh, any cases in the esophagus or the upper stomach, there is a clear advantage of the robot over conventional laparoscopy. And again, we even have special training because errors do happen. So for example, if a patient bleeds suddenly in a robotic surgery, there is something called an emergency undock. So within 30 seconds, the robot is out and the surgeon is there uh, on the patient. Any other questions? Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? No more questions. Yeah, I also have one question. Mm. Uh, how much you rate your dependence and, uh, on the AI integrated in the device? So um, the, the dependence is becoming more and more. And this is becoming a big problem in the medical field. I was at a conference in Norway uh, last year. And they were saying that surgeons these days in developed countries have become so dependent when they go and try to help out the, the developing countries in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, they have very little to offer especially the newer generations, because they're all trained how to use the robot, how to use laparoscopy. And when they go there to try to help, none of these instruments are there. So there's very little the, the developed countries are now are able to offer. the And this is where the divide is happening. And this is where the danger is. We're becoming more and more reliant on AI and uh, robotics, that sometimes we're losing the basic skills. And it's a topic of big discussion in the surgical field. Yes, uh, question from Dr. Haider. Uh, thank you very much for this fantastic uh, presentation. One quick question. How much on average it takes for a surgeon to be trained using these uh, robots in order to perform the surgery? Excellent question. So the process is uh, first what we do is something called a learning curve. 
So each procedure has a different learning curve. Uh, basic procedures, like a gallbladder, if you do 10 cases, you can fly solo. But cases that are more uh, complicated, like colon cases, you need 30, 35 cases. However, to be certified as a robotic surgeon, first you need to do uh, something that uh, we do, we call in-service training. So you need to be trained as an assistant first, how to dock and undock the robot. Then you need to do around 20 hours on the simulator. We have a simulator that you use on the robot. And then you have to do a course uh, that's done by Intuitive, the company that owns the robot. It's not performed in Kuwait, you have to do it outside. And then you have to do 30 cases proctored, supervised. After that, you're qualified as a robotic surgeon. So currently in Kuwait, I think there's around six or seven qualified robotic surgeons but we have 10 uh, in the line waiting to be uh, certified soon, inshallah. It's a long process, but you can see it's a complicated machine, yeah, and the last thing you need is for a mistake to happen. Yeah. Yeah, one last question. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you for this uh, presentation. I just have a question regarding complication. If any complication happen in the surgery with the robotics, mm. you should be very ready that you include and go by yourself and do the, the operation or the machine can also take it over. The machine, unfortunately, uh, as it stands, uh, cannot detect these errors. Uh, the newer machines, uh, I know there's, so, so there are five or six robots coming into the market now because Da Vinci that, that had monopoly over the robots since the 90s lost all the patents last year. So they don't have the patents anymore. There's newer machines, uh, even Da Vinci themselves are uh, using different technology to help detect these errors. But for the time being, what we do is we have a surgeon who is always standing next to the patient. So the main operating surgeon is on the console, which is maybe five, six meters from the patient. But there is a surgeon who's scrubbed in and ready, sitting next to the patient just in case something happens. They quickly undock the robot, and they will access uh, to, to do it. We've had to emergency undock just once in Jabir, uh, not because of the surgery, because of the patient's heart. Uh, she developed a heart attack w during the surgery, so we had to undock until the anesthetist brought her heart back and then we continued the surgery. Yes, um, thank you Dr. Salman for such great talk. Thankfully we have confirmation that uh, AI Sanko will not take over our, uh, you know, <laughs> caliphate surgeons. For now, for now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. in the future maybe. Yeah, thank you for thank the you talk. Very much. Um, please, uh, Dr. Salman, stay for a while because Mr. Hamza want to honor you in advance. Okay, in behalf of uh, Kuwait University President, Professor Mohammed Saad Al-Fadli, the chair of the conference, we would like to uh, present Uh, now we invite you all for the lunch break uh, and the prayer break. Please, uh, you are welcome uh, in the pharmacy lobby. Uh, if you need any guidance, uh, public relations are there. And our respected students as uh, conference event teams uh, will guide you there. Thank you very much. We will see you after uh, half an hour, yeah? Half an hour to 40 minutes. We should be. 1.45, yeah? Resume.